da ba da da di da ya da da di da yo da 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 di da 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 di da 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 di ya yo ho 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 evening everyone how are we doing tonight let's see before you get worried that that's all the iron brew that is tonight well i should have enough to see us through May your glass forever be charged. Right now, let's see who we've got to say hello to. Ah, hello, King's Rook. Hello, Juno191. Um, hmm. Hello, Carl von Gasberg. <laughs> Juno191, I need a coffee, but the coffee machine is bust. Uh, isn't that... What the granules which you pour in and then you stir with hot water and then add milk if you're that way inclined or sugar or other things. Don't add iron brudo to coffee, it really doesn't work. It was quite funny to watch their face, but it doesn't work. Uh John Shea, hello. Abelski, hello. <laughs> Greg Stowski, hello. Calvin, I said hello. Aviator Enterprise, hello. All oh, trucks, they did. Hello, Dunrick Ironhammer. <laughs> Kings Rook, I'm sorry to see it here that your hip's in pain. If you're anything like my mum, it's constant and it's annoying. Um. She has one of those chairs which does sort of position yourself up quite well, and that does help her a bit. That and lots and lots of tea and I uh, and lots and lots of tea and Ribena and all sorts of things. Drinking, uh, you know, drinking plenty of fluids helps. It seems. Ah, right, Kingsrook, how are you doing, Doctor Alex? I'm doing fine. Hello, Yickers. I've been having a fun few days because I've been teaching A-level politics for the last four days. So they were great students, a lot of fun, but it was two students on one online teaching. So it was kind of... <sighs> by the end of it, because it's all on you. Now, interesting enough, I will add, and this might say... We'll see if today is better or not better, because there is now this, which is an internet cable. Because what I did was I found a flat cable, which can go under doors, because I can't make it through the wall, because that would damage the wallpaper on the other side. So I got a 10 meter long flat cable, which runs from the literally less than two meters away from me straight through that uh, straight from laptop to broadband transmitter there but it's a 10 meter long one which goes all the way around through the door along the corridor through the door all the way along that wall and the back and to the bro uh, to the um, hub so hopefully that helps greg sasaki heresy that is not coffee uh, i don't drink coffee or tea so it's all heresy to me um, hello, Boucher Butter. Hello, DGV40. Hello, Strub. Have you read the Safe Hold series by David Weber? You mentioned in chat that you were looking into reading it. I have not managed to read it yet. I've got it. I haven't managed to read it yet. Mainly because I've been teaching a little politics. Do you know what I'm... That's a lot. I can beat that. I had coffee and spit it out because I take two... It was sugar. It wasn't salt. It was salt. <laughs> oh. Dan Freeman, you went to the National Gallery and you didn't see Tr Turner's Temera. That's just that is terrible. It's just the, the gallery's going down. Um, good evening, the Purposeide. Amra Fernand, good evening. Hello, I don't think I've said hello to you before, so hello, I will wave Iron Brew because the hands are currently full. <laughs> oh. 
<laughs> oh, I will not repeat that online. My girlfriend would kill me. All right. It wasn't on the Dan Furan, it wasn't on the curated tours we did. That is rather sad. It's very, very sad. Actually, I think though, I am going to post quickly a picture to the community. So you can all see what I have in front of me because I have got fed up with staring at a camera because I've been doing so much teaching and so much staring at a camera recently. So now I have someone sitting there. Mm. It should be like, after all, afternoon all, it's the start of Veterans Week, and half here in Canada, just to watch a documentary on how the Canadians killed Michael Whitman. Well, I'm annoyed in that my poppy, which I ordered for this year, hasn't arrived yet. I got a naval one coming. Um, just to sort of, you know, I don't, I'm not one of those people who wears a poppy for a massively long time. It goes on on the 1st of November and till about the, the, the Remembrance Sunday. And then after that, and that's my personal choice because, as I think I've told you, um, my book, when it comes out, it's going to have three seagulls on it. And those represent my great uncles who died in World War Two. So that's why I tend to wear a naval poppy. So it's a it's from the British Legion. So it goes to them the money, but it's one of the ones with the navy badges on. And I get a new one each year, and we get one, we get more. But you know, hasn't arrived yet, sadly enough, which you can understand in the current circumstances. <laughs> Come on, uh, Jeff Miller, hello. Angus Sonor, hello. Jameth, hello. Come on, come on. It doesn't, it does not, if one does not drink instant coffee, then he is not suffering enough from caffeine withdrawal. Mm. Kingsford, I'm constantly worried that Dr. Alex is going to spill the iron brew while pouring into the glass. I have the picture of me at that angle. I can watch myself on the camera while watching the chat. That is the entire reason I do that. <laughs> the Pope's side, Dr. Clark, uh, thank you for the, your book recommending, recommendation on Australian naval policy before World War I. It's an excellent read and just what I was looking for. Glad it helped. Austrian, name of Austrian. Yeah, it's a good book. Jeff Bieler. Ooh. Come on, How the FRA poodle reacts to cable. Uh, he doesn't mind it. He's pretty much ignored it. And besides, I've strung it behind everything, so it's not really in his way. Jeff Miller, in Canada, we all wear the same poppy and it's only memorise our war dead. No politics like in the UK. In the UK, it's, it can be a minefield. There are some people who are really obsessed with who's wearing a poppy and who's not. Greg Salsky, those blue lights look like number five from Short Circuit. Yes, that's exactly why I got it. 
I'm not the only one who remembers Short Circuit. Yay! <laughs> uh, no, Pitch. Pitch Pitch is cool. And Pitch Pitch, there is the little Pitch Pitch. And there was Big Pitch Pitch, which is the mum. But he, he didn't like the mum as much. The mum he used to sleep on, that one he used to carry everywhere. So that one has gone in the camera, and Mummy Pidge Pidge goes below the camera. <laughs> Kings are, I've heard that arguments over white versus red poppies get nasty. Yeah. There are all sorts of different poppies. There are lots of reasons, although I'm not allowed to buy the um, by my family. I am banned from buying the little plastic and paper poppies because I lose them, and I end up buying a new one every single day. So I always have to have the metal ones because otherwise they get lost. Um, just running around, I do not know how. I just have a magical affinity; they just disappear on me. Good lord, Jeff Beeler, your military, your history channel will actually show military history on November the 11th? Goodness gracious me, that's a, that's a massive achievement. The, yeah, the hickers. Yeah, I go for a lot of poppies. They come off the jacket of the shirt. They do. They just come off. We, I have no idea where they go. They just go. They just disappear. Right. <laughs> How about I turn you the right way around? Then it won't look quite so bad. Or strange. <sighs> right then. So today we've got some books which you've heard of before, some books which I haven't covered before, and some books which I've actually covered in four random books, but I feel like going into in more depth because they just fit. And they're nice. But I am planning on, once I eventually get my garden office all set up, to have all sorts, far more books available. I've got whole boxes of books I can't get at at the moment, and it's just interesting. Jeff Beeler, in Canada, it is traditional to buy a new poppy every day as you can buy them everywhere. It raises more money. See, this is my thing. I always see them in the wrong country. Although, to be fair, our history channel doesn't really, it doesn't do your options either, so I might still be in the wrong country. Happy no, uh, hello Brock Fane. Happy November. One should. When you put the plastic poppy on, push the grate. Mm, to be fair, I do all sorts of tricks to try and give it. It doesn't work. It just doesn't. No idea why. Just doesn't work. Right then. It is now. Ooh. Well, that's rather interesting. It's always good to know how long, you're, how far behind the video being displayed to you all is versus the video I'm doing now. My video, my live, is up at to 15 minutes and 40 seconds. 
I think yours is somewhere in the in the 14 minute section. So you're about a minute behind me. And I am starting off with AJ Slim. Defeating the victory by William Slim. Now, why am I banging on about this again? Because if there is a Forgotten Army, and I do sometimes prescribe to it in World War II, although I think there's also a Forgotten Fleet as well, it is the British Army in Burma. If we have a Forgotten, if we ever have put all our generals and all our field marshals throughout history together, there'd be two I would put at the top front, and I wouldn't be sure which to pick between. One of those would be William Slim. The other one would be Arthur Wellesley, Duke of Wellington. I like Montgomery, actually. I know he's a bit of a Marmite figure, but he still he would be in my top five. He just wouldn't be in my top two. And, yeah. Those two, frankly... Exceed. And Slim. This little book is very, very full of all sorts of interesting things. And what I was interested to find was that there is actually a quite a good, quite a good version of it available. It's like uh, the next one I'll be getting to. There is a wonderfully more recently 2007 version published. So it's quite easy to track down. And this, sort of, uh, this is the sort of thing he has in here. I spent several days going around the Arakan front, watching the operations of both divisions, inspecting the administrative box, and discussing the future with Crisson and his commanders. It was clear that the enemy counterstroke in Arakan would not be long delayed, and while it was difficult to judge in what strength it would come, we both agreed it would take the form of an outflanking attack on the 7th Division's left. Christian was at the time the beginning to transfer his weight to the east of the range. This reinforcing the 7th Division suited well with our ideas of the enemy's intentions, and it was continued. At the same time, Christian warned that v the V-Force post screening the left to be particularly alert and to have patrolling on that flank to be intensified to obtain warning of any hostile moves. Christensen and I agreed that if 15 Corps troops were cut off, they would stand fast. I promised that, when necessary, they would be supplied by air and that they would be relieved by our counter-attacking forces with whom they were to cooperate by taking the offensive themselves at the first opportunity. When I left Mesovi's headquarters east of the range and drove through the Nagavetica Pass on my way to the airstrip on 15 corps at the uh, 15 corps at the end of the visit, Japanese fighters were beginning to come over in formations of up to a hundred at a time. This challenge to our air force was clearly the opening move of the enemy counterstroke. It was heartening to see our fellows to how our fellows took it up. Our Spitfires, much inferior numbers, barely laced into the uh, laced into the zeros and began most effectively to knock them out the sky. Whilst these whirlwind dogfights streaked about, in the air, uh, high, about high in the clear air, our reconnaissance hurricanes kept up their steady patrols. I was impressed by the conduct of the reconnaissance squadron of the Indian Air Force. Flying in pairs, the Indian pilots and their outmoded hurricanes went out time and again in the face of overwhelming enemy fighter superiority. I looked in on the squadron just at a time when news had come in that the last patrol had run into a bunch of zeros and been shot down. The Sikh squadron leader, an old friend of mine, at once took out the next patrol himself and completed a mission. His methods, rumours had it, were a little unorthodox. It was said that if any of his young officers made a bad landing, he would take them behind a basher and beat them. Whatever he did, it was effective. They were a happy and efficient and very gallant squadron. At Chittagong, I warned Lomax and his 26th Division that they would probably be needed, and needed in a hurry. Then on to my headquarters at Camilla to meet General Gifford on his way in his turn to visit Arakan. I found him in complete agreement with my estimate of the situation and the measures we were taking. He also cheered me very much by telling me that he would order the 36th British Division from Calcutta into Shitakong to replace the 26th Division if I had to move itself. He went on to Christensen and I checked out over with Snelling, my chief administrative officer. Old commanding the troop... Uh, commanding the troop carrier compound and Baldwin of the 3rd Tactical Air Force. The arrangements for air supply to 15 Corps, should it be required. The Joint Air Force and Army Organization, which had been supplying the 81st West African Division, had already been adjusted to meet possible new demands. 
Stalin quietly warned the air supply units and organizations at the Camilla and Agatala airstrips to go full out on the prearranged packing program and to stand by for 24 hours a day working. The supply units were reinforced by Indian pioneers who took over most of the non-technical work. Additional transport was allotted to airfields. British reinforcement camps were told to earmark men to help supervise packing, and we called for volunteers to fly the aircraft as kickers out, whose task it was to push the stores out of the aircraft. The complete maintenance of over a division for several days, everything that it would require from pills to projectiles from bully beef to boots was laid out, packed for dropping by at airstrips. We were as ready as we could be, yet when the Japanese struck, I was ashamed to say it was a surprise. On the 1st of February, Frank Festing, the commander of the 36th British Division, arrived at my headquarters just ahead of his division. On the 2nd, General Gillard returned from his tour of Arakan and left again for Delhi the next day. He had had a narrow escape when shot up by zeros in the Nagadigu Pass. On the morning of the 4th, not feeling too bright myself as I had just had my ninth daily Emma time injection for dysentery, I was out at a reinforcement camp a few miles from Camilla watching a demonstration of the, to us, new Lifebuoy flamethrower when a motorcycle dispatch rider roared up with an urgent message. It told me the Japanese had suddenly swept down out of the blue and rushed at Tangang Bazaar, five or six miles in the rear of 7th Division. The situation was obscure, said the signal, but it was clear the enemy were in considerable strength. The only thing I can think of more depressing than the effect of a series of Emmentine injections is the receipt of a message such as this. I had expected ample warning of the Japanese move, but this meant that we had passed right around 7th Division unobserved, and were within two or three miles of the Nekadek Pass and the administrative box, which I knew was prepared for nothing more than raids. I was angry and disappointed that all our precautions had failed to give warning of the enemy move, but trying not to look as anxious as I felt, I quickly got, got back to the headquarters and telephoned Christian. He could tell me little more, except the Mazivis Reserve Brigade was engaged in heavy fighting somewhere south of Taung Bazaar. It was a real Japanese breakthrough and looked nasty. This was not cheerful news. I rang Lone Lanks at Chitgong and warned him to be ready to move at short notice. Meanwhile, my principal staff officers had assembled and I gave them the news, reminding them what the things are, that things are never as bad or as good as they first reported. On the 5th of February, I gave Lomax orders to move to, Shita, uh, Christian, uh, to join Christian at Bali Bazaar, and General Gifford flew to my headquarters. Some commanders-in-chief I would not have welcomed at such a moment, but General Gifford had the invaluable knack of not interfering, yet making one feel that he was, de he was there, calm, helpful, and understanding, if required. Early on the 6th, I flew to Chittagong, saw Lomax just off the Christian, and watched the last of the 26th Division, a workmanlike and cheerful force moving out. Then I saw festing of the 36th Division, the Brigadier Commanding Shittagon Air of the Line Communications, and Air Commodore Gray Commanding 224 Group of the RAF. Everything was working smoothly, there was no flap, and the 36th Division was 20, taking 26th Division place in Army Reserve. Next day, after a conference with Baldwin and Old and Old out of the Troop Carrier Command, and a talk on the phone with Christensen, I told Stanley to put the 7th Division on to air supply. The switchover, as far as I was concerned, was simple. Thanks to the preparation that 14th Army, 3rd Tactical Air Force and Troop Carrier Command together had made, it required only the word go. I made one attempt to interfere with Stang's arrangements. Wouldn't it be a good idea, I said, to put a case of rum in every 4th or 5th plane so as to make sure that when the stuff is shoved out, the, tra the chaps will r really search for it? Al Snelling looked at me in the slight pitying way the professionals look at him and said, Sir, he said, I've already given orders that a case of rum should be put in every plane. I thought you'd enjoy that passage. Uh, Ron Shammer, when you get uh, put the plastic poppy on, put, uh, did, I that? Uh, did you know 101? Are you going to get a travel class model, more specific, Hyder and HMS Belfast? Uh, that'd be tempting. That'd be nice. Uh, replace the pin with a safety pin. Uh, I've tried that one. All I ended up doing was drawing blood, my own. Dr. Clark is going to turn that office into his man cave. Eh, more a library, but yeah. Well, she goes, um, I don't think I like the idea of a white poppy. Too close to the white feathers, and I pretty genuinely hate that. Eh, that's my issue with it. But I understand why people have, feel they need to do it, and that's for them. It's a personal choice. That's what I would say. Poppies are personal choice. Brock Payne. Little book. Might we even call it a slim book? 
Maybe. <sighs> Jeff Beard, Arakan, first campaign where Slim was bypassed and the troops paid the price. Plover side, T feed in the victory, 1099, payback, Amazon Prime. And you'll should find a link down below in the to my Amazon store. And it's all the books we talked about today are in the brew ships group. All of them are in there, other than ones which you cannot literally find on Amazon. Hmm. There are going to be some little model ships in that. Um, I do have a fair number of those around for tribal class destroyers and things. I have about three different models of Esco HMS Eskimo to build at some point. <laughs> do you know what? A general who gives a case of rum in every plane. Yeah. <laughs> well, it works. <laughs> Hello, Jack Hunter. Yeah, it's a. Hello, Kilo 19. This is one of those books, and it always feels strange to say this to people. There are some history books and there are some books you read where you just sort of go, oh, this is very much, this is a, the official story. Slim doesn't go for the official story. In fact, if you read the official stories of the campaign, they are far more sanitized. This is the commander-in-chief of the force out there, and his book is one of the least sanitized accounts I have read. In that, in uh, any bits that are sanitized, they are probably sanitized out of not a desire to make it look perfect or to provide it with a beautiful picture for the people back home, but to protect the men who came home who didn't want their families to know the full horror of what they went through. If there are any sanitizations in this book, that is what I strongly suspect from reading this book and other accounts of Slim, that is why they are there. It is a very good book. If you haven't read it and you're interested in... Burma in the whole ca the British performance in Southeast Asia in why uh, I will always maintain that if you had Roger Keyes out in charge in Southeast Asia and you put Slim in charge of the fences of Singapore and Malaysia, the Japanese would not have managed to get anywhere near Singapore is this book. Because the difference in personality between someone like Slim, if he's given a senior officer who can deal with the politics, because Slim doesn't like dealing with the politics. He's okay at it. He does it. He learns. He's workmanlike with the politics, but he's good with the strategy. He's good with the fight. He's good with leading the forces. So if you give him a good, a good political one, it's one of the reasons why he actually does work quite well with one of my least favorite people, as we all know. And he works quite well with him because that gentleman is very good at politics, although not, not particularly that good at working out actually what's best for the Navy long term. But Mountbatten is Mountbatten. Slim is someone worth reading. And this is always a strange thing. When you're a naval historian and you are telling people to go read about an army general and his personal account of an operations which do include a few amphibious operations, do include a lot of air supplies, all these things. But it's the realities of the decisions he's making and the reasons he's making them and why he puts it in there. It's a good book. Dan Freeman, free HMS Eskimo, one for each bell. Um, possible. Possibly. Possibly. Jeff Beeler, Slim gets his boss removed and takes his job. To be fair, it, 
He doesn't so much get his boss removed as his boss managed to get himself removed. Juno one one. The last thing anyone wants to do is get between an Englishman and their alcohol. You do that, it's like just looking at, at one tribal the wrong way. To be fair, you get between me and my iron brew. That's gonna be, that'll be um. <laughs> oh, yeah, get between me and my iron brew. There might be problems. <clears throat> Unfortunately, Mountbatten comes up a lot in life. That's the disturbing thing in history, despite the fact we try and ignore it. I always remember the example given of him when he was a destroyer captain, and one of the books we'll actually be dealing with that in a second, we're going through, is that um, he's very good at making noise about things, not getting them sorted. Juicy Susan, good afternoon. Paul Beswick, good afternoon. Paul Beswick, if a Type 31 was named after the Tribals, which names would you pick? Well, I'd love Eskimo and Cossack to ride again. Honestly, I I'm not sure if it would get past the PC Brigade, but I hope Asante would, because frankly, she deserves it, as does HMS Nubian. I think Nubian, Cossack, and Eskimo could get could sort of get be allowed. Uh, there are ways you could make the case for them. Asante would be more difficult, but considering the history of HMS Asante and what she got up to, that would be thing. And then there's HMS Gurkha. So that's the five. No one's going to object to an HMS Gurkha. If they did, the Gurkhas might object to them. Um, no one likes the concept of a Gurkha objecting to you. Bill from Jagardco. Seems a shame that man. Was everyone expecting him to be his dad? Mmm... Potentially. Jemak, HMS Seek and Gurkha. Would, HMS Seek would be okay. Yeah, that'd be the sixth one. Mm. And HMS Tata, so there's number seven. That'd be okay. Uh, going through the rest of the lists. Hmm. I doubt HMS Viking. Let's see. I doubt HMS Viking. So, entry does the CPU usage, usage seems to be okay this evening. Seems to be not causing any trouble, and I think the data seems to be going okay. <laughs> 
But let's look, would Eskimo morph into Inuit? Probably not. Royal Navy don't tend to morph names. <laughs> so, now I have an original edition of Happy Odyssey. But I found a version which was published in 2007, a reprint version, which is in, if you go down to my um, Amazon storefront thingamajiggy, you'll find in the brew ships list, you'll find it. And this is Agent Descartes and Wyatt's book, Happy Odyssey. And yeah. Chapter four. Fighting the Mad Mullah. It was extraordinary to think of my utter ignorance of world affairs. And please note, before, if anyone is watching this later and is getting upset with me. This book was written in 1950. It seems extraordinary to think of my utter ignorance of world affairs. But at that, even then, pregnant moment... I finally imagined I should be one of the few people to see a shot fired in anger, and I could hardly believe my ears when at Brindisi or Malta we heard that Germany and Russia were at war. And my cup of misery overflowed when on arrival at Eden I learned that England also had declared war on Germany. Our only idea was to get back to England by fair means or foul, but our efforts were fruitless, and we arrived next morning in Beraba, thousands of miles from the main battlefield, en route for a secondary little affair. It felt like playing in a village cricket match instead of in a test. The Mad Muller was still in command of the dervishes and had held that position for years by sheer force of magnetic personality. He had started life as a stoker, but had shaken off the dust to become a colourful and romantic figure, always fighting superior odds, but managing to inspire the dervishes with that degree of fanaticism that makes death a privilege. In spite of many expeditions against them, he had evaded capture, and when he was finally defeated by aeroplanes, I felt a sense of real personal loss. He was a godsend to officers when of an urge to fight and a shaky or non-existence bank balance. When I first arrived in Somaliland, the Karif was still blowing, a hot, labouring wind heavy with sand, and the climate of Bereba at sea level was singularly unpleasant. We left at once for Burara, some 1,500 feet up, where in spite of the tail end of the Karif, the climate was very delightful. I knew at once that I loved Somaliland. The country seemed to consist of endless sand adorned with extremely thorny bushes, but it exhaled a friendliness towards me that made me forget my personal worries and imbued me with a jeu de vivre that I had not felt in my palmy, uh, palmy days in England. The Somali is a Mohammedan, but his prayers are spasmodic and indulged in with feverish energy only when in the near neighbourhood of a dervish. I can still see the evening I arrived in Doro. It was towards the end of the Mohammedan feast of Ramadan, when the feast is broken, a fast is broken by the first sight of the new moon. There were hundreds of Somalis silhouetted against the darkening sky, gaping with rapturous eyes at the relentless dust clouds and with their empty bellies rattling. Suddenly the clouds parted, the new moon winked a second and was gone. A yell went up from the hungry souls and the fast was over. The Somalis were a fine-looking bunch and very smart in the uniform we gave them. It consisted of a sweater, short, putties, and a khaki kamabund and a puggery. They were cheerful soldiers, or rather excitable natures, but capable of greatness. One officer who had been in very hard fight with the Dervishes told me that the Somalis had formed the square and were being heavily attacked. One of his men, having fired all this ammunition, quite simply put his rifle across his shoulders and walked into the Dervishes. These are the gestures that sound so useless on paper, but are so gripping, in fact, and give to war the touch of the sublime. Uh, the Somalis were... Uh, one of my orderlies had a particularly luxuriant head of hair. I had dismissed him after the morning parade and told him to report for next parade in about two hours' time. He duly turned up, but with his entire head shaved, and when I asked him why, he merely remarked he'd had a headache. Once we had a Somali sergeant, very badly wounded, and as our doctor thought his case was hopeless, he told him he might go home. Two or three weeks later, the man turned up as right as rain. When asked how he managed to recover, he said he had a camel dung putler supplied to his wound. 
He was ahead of his time, as it was only in this last war that our doctors discovered that wounds should be allowed to putrefy and heal themselves, a nauseating but extremely satisfactory cure. All the officers in the Camel Corps were British, seconded from British or Indian regiments. We were a mixed crowd, and I suppose our only common denominator was that we were all short of cash, a fact quite unnoticeable in Somaliland, which was about the one and only place on earth where one could not use it. Uh, the week after my arrival, Colonel Tim Cubitt arrived to take over command of all the troops in the country, consisting of ourselves and an Indian infantry contingent. Colonel Cubitt was a first-class soldier and a fine leader of men. The essentials to the art of leadership have been argued and prodded some, uh, since time immemorial, but to me it rests simply in the quality of the man. He either has it or he hasn't. Tom Cubitt had it, and the troops felt it and responded immediately. In appearance, he reminded me of Tom Bridges, tall, attractive, and full of a genial bonhomie, and all the human frailties that make one love a man instead of just admiring him. His flow of language was unrivaled. He never bothered with spades being spades. They were always bloody shovels. Pug Ismay, now Lord Ismay, became his staff officer, did very fine work in Somaliland, but by his foreignness, soundness, and utter dependability, he made himself indispensable to that theatre of war and was never allowed to get back to Europe. What was Somaliland's gain was certainly a dead loss to the other arenas. Paddy Howard, John Hornby, brother of, the, of Butcher and the toughest officer I ever met, and Boomer Colokan were all good hard men who made the best of a bad job. In Guaro, we started training in real earnest, and having every confidence in Colonel Cupbit, we knew he would attack the dervishes immediately if it was possible. We could shoot only around the camp, but we managed to keep our larder well stocked, and while away in between hours between polo and hockey. Lawrence, who commanded the Camel Corps, had an attractive, tame, cheap ass, a charming pet when it was not feeding, but a dangerous one when it was. One day it dashed out on some goats, and the old woman herding them lifted and drove a spear straight through it, thinking in a wild cheetah, a tragic end. At the same time, she was a very brave old woman. On no November the 14th, Colonel Cubitt received permission from authorities to attack. The dervishes were known to have established themselves in some blockhouses at Shimba Beres, and on the 17th we marched, hoping to attack on the 18th. Until then, our troops had always waited for the dervishes to attack, then formed squares and killed as many as they could. This time the methods were to be new. We managed to march to Shimba Beres and arrive unmolested, and within four or five hundred yards of the dervishes, here we waited while our OC decided how and when to tackle them. The blockhouse facing us was about 14 feet square, made of stone, and with the solidarity of a mono and minor fortress, a most unpleasant and formidable objective. Colonel Cummett was in doubt as to which troops to use. He favoured the Indian contingent, but as I was very anxious for him to use my Somali company, he allowed me to prevail upon him. I had been warned that Somalis in the early stages of the fight were liable to turn their backs on their proceedings, but I felt full confidence of confidence in my men, and my faith in them was justified. Waiting for decision was distinctly amusing, for the dervishes kept popping up and hurling insults at us, all querying our legitimacy, and as they jumped up, jumped, we, we took pot shots at them. Although we did no damage, and they never fired us in return, it relieved the tedium of waiting for zero hour, and saved us from any anticipated cold feet. It's a good little book. And as I said, there is a 2007 published version, which I found on Amazon, so I put that in the link in uh, the Amazon store thing. Mm -hmm. The Grand Chiefs of the Haida had issues when HMCS Haida was ceremony recommissioned as the faction of the RSAN. Uh, they did eventually consent after the RCN uh, actually talked to them. Well, that's sensible. <sighs> Jay Villa, I think we will have another city class since almost all our ships are named for places. Fleet Auxiliaries, I think as the Type 26s are city classes, I wouldn't be surprised if the Type 31s were counties. Which will magically be those counties which don't have cities named for them uh, serving in the Royal Navy. Not that the Royal Navy would ever do that, uh, do that so for political reasons at all. Mm. Sir Johnson, oh, afternoon. Sorry I'm late. Uh, I had, it's been a marathon a few days. 
snowing now here, so I'm glad I got most of my list done. Very good to get your most of your list done before the snow comes. I'm wondering if all these lockdowns will have any effect on the weather and whether we might actually be more likely to get snow this year, but that's just my idle musings. Mm. I think if the Type 31 sort of flower class, that would be interesting. It will be. Mm hmm. Hmm. But no. Carlton the Weird's book is. How do I have a picture somewhere? And it is rather a cool thing. Oh, yep. That's the 2007, I think, published version of um, Carlton DeWitt's book. It's good. Although, I do find that picture strange because if you consider the picture here, in here, you can see his full, you know, eye patch. This one, they've got him facing that way, so you can't see his eye patch. You know, but it's a cool book. Mm. <laughs> Dan Fuhrman, Dr. Clark, why authors have editors? So, Adrian Carlton, who went, why did those in your like Germans keep surrendering and stopping me from having fun or an autobiography? Um, yes. Actually, it's pretty much, why was there ever peace? It just bores me. It's um, quite a good one. It's, uh, it, it, it's, uh, he's a fairly interesting officer. He is a fairly interesting officer. He is. He certainly has personality in spades, an absolute spades. Oh, yeah, fifty minutes. Oh, good lord.
Now this one is slightly different. This book is slightly different. I don't think I've read to you from it before. Do you know why I am? He is one of those officers who leads from the front and probably says, come and have a go if you think you're hard enough. Yes. I would say, practically, he'd probably just have that tat. If he had, had had a tattoo, he'd probably had it tattooed across him. The next point was of prime importance to those of us who had transferred from Eagle. We had brought eight crews, but only five swordfish. Who was to go? We found that the first strike was to be led by Lieutenant Commander uh, K. Williamson, the CO of 815 Squadron from Illustrious. Our Captain Ollie Patch, Royal Marines, who had led us at Bomber, was to be in charge of the bombers and flare droppers, with Lieutenant D.C. Goodwin as his observer. Lieutenant Ken C.C. Grieve of 813 Squadron be observer to Lieutenant C.B. Lamb, a pilot from Illustrious. Lieutenant Maud of A13 with Sub Lieutenant W.A. Bull as an observer. With man a torpedo aircraft. The second strike was to be led by Lieutenant Commander J.W. Hale, the CEO of 819 Squadron. Lieutenant G.A. Carlene as observer. Lieutenant ba uh, Bailey of 813, with Lieutenant H.J. Slaughter, be a torpedo dropper. Finally, 824 would provide me with my usual observer, Pat Humphreys, to try to torpedo one of the battleships. Good evening, John Luke. And hello, Felix B. So now I knew. Ever since the idea of Taranto had been mooted, I had had a premonition that the burden of torpedo dropping would fall upon me. <coughs> this was probably due to my having, over the last few months, thrown a few fish at ships with a certain amount of success, such as in our attack at Bomber. My feelings were mixed. Certainly it was a boost to the ego to have been chosen, but on the other hand, it looked a pretty hairy operation, with less chance of returning in one piece than on earlier ventures. There was nothing to be done about it but put my faith in my friendly little devil, Joey, who had looked after me since I had first learned to fly. I had a drink and looked, tried to look enthusiastic. During the few days before judgment, we had not been overworked, but I did have a trip which had become a little uh, dicey on the 8th of November. Pat Humphreys and I, with uh, leading airman of Ferragon, a uh, tail air gunner, were sent off to search for the ever-elusive Italians. As usual, we didn't find them, but we found the cruiser Ajax looking for our fleet. We gave them the position by our this lamp. After leaving the cruiser, we found a Cant 7501 flying boat sitting in the sea with two perfectly healthy-looking men in it. It was one that the Fulmars had shot down earlier. Having completed the search, we returned to the position where we expected to find the fleet. There was nothing but water in any direction. I had every faith in Pat's navigation, so we're sure that this was not his fault. We started a square search, but dust was falling in the fleet, not showing any lights. We were afraid of passing by without seeing it. We were relieved when we got a DF bearing, uh, that's probably from the beacon, uh, from Illustrious and soon found her. By that time, it was pitch dark, but I managed to make one of my better night deck landings. There had nearly been one aircraft and crew short for the raid. We were only required to do one more routine anti-submarine patrol on the morning of the 10th. After landing, we found that we were to rest until the following evening. We attended some updated briefings, studied the weather reports, and kept an eye on our aircraft. In fact, we had the utmost faith in the ground crews, who checked and rechecked everything. The people who are working hardest were on the unfortunate fitters of 819 Squadron, who, after the disastrous loss of three aircraft, had to drain and completely flush out the tanks and engines of all the squadron aircraft, then refuel them from a ship's, different ship's tank. They worked all night at the jack job. It was now the morning of the 11th of November, so we had had, uh, we had time on our hands to find out how our huge operation, MB-8, was faring. Our force learned force A, comprising almost the whole of the Mediterranean fleet. Um, uh, it was an impressive sight, and we flying people probably had a better view than those in ships, with us in illustrious flag of the rear ammo aircraft uh, carriers, where the battleships War Sprite, flag commander-in-chief Mediterranean, Cunningham, Malaya, flag of Rear Admiral Law Rawlings, Valiant and Ramillies. We had a third cruiser squadron, Gloucester, flag of Rear Admiral Renouf, and York. We were covered by three groups of destroyer, the second DF, Hyphron, Havoc, Hero, Herod, Hasty, and Ilex, 
The 20th Division, Decoy and Defender. The 14th, the Stroyer Flotilla, Nubian, Mohawk, Janus, Juno and Jervis. However, we kept growing and shrinking as units left to carry out jobs and others joined us from other duties. On the 7th and 8th, Ajax and Sydney, cruisers had joined us after taking HQ-14 Infantry Brigade and equipment from Port Said to Suda Bay. On 9th, Ramillies and three destroyers had been detached to cover the convoy from Alexandria to Malta, then to cover the fast convoy ME-3 to Alex. Today, Orion joined us after I had dashed to the Paris and Crete. Yesterday, we steamed westwards to a position 40 miles west of Malta to make our rendezvous with the reinforcements for our fleet and were joined by the battleships Barham, the cruiser Berwick and Glasgow, the destroyers Griffin, Greyhound and Gallant. These ships immediately left us to disembark two, the 2,000 troops they were carrying in Malta before rejoining us. Apart from our diversion to meet Barham's party, we in Illustrious had spent our time in a more or less central position between Malta and Crete to give general cover to the various groups against any foray by Italian surface forces, and as far as possible to provide some fighter cover with our full miles. The only other fighters available in that part of the sea were three gladiators, small biplanes, which were beautiful aircraft to fly, but hardly a match for modern low-wing monoplanes. They were based in Malta, and for some months were to be Lyland's only protection against daily air attacks from the Italian fields in Sicily, which were an easy range. They christened them Faith, Hope and Charity, Malta was in a most vulnerable position and was to put up a marvellous resistance that became one of the epic defensive actions in history, resulting in its being awarded the George Cross by George, King George VI. Despite its defensive role, it was to remain a base for our offensive operations and its swordfish were to be a major factor in the disruption of supply convoys to the Axis forces in North Africa. We had thought that all these ships scattered over the Mediterranean would have given the Rager Aeronautica a series of field days. However, we had suffered very little from enemy air activity. At lunchtime on the 8th, a reconnaissance aircraft had spotted us and been driven off by our fighters, but obviously had reported us being because in the afternoon another appeared and was driven, again driven off. Within the hour, seven SM-79s materialised. These were attacked by three full miles, which shot down two of them and made the others jettison their bombs and leave the scene immediately hurriedly. Yesterday, the 10th, when we were west of Malta to meet Barham, we were again shadowed and the full miles shot down a Kant 7501. This was followed uh, about an hour later by the arrival of 10 SM-79s. They were flying at about 14,000 feet and were again attacked by our full mast and dropped their bombs at random, don't, doing no damage. Their submarines had not had any great success. Warspite had heard two underwater explosions, which must have been torpedoes self-destructing, and Ramleys covering MEA-3 heard three such explosions. No ship was hit, although Italian radio claimed a successful attack. I joined most of the other pilots in the hangar to see our aircraft being armed for our jaunt that night. The bombers and flare droppers were being loaded with 250 pound SAP, that's semi armed piercing bombs. These aircraft carried a different type of long range tank from those carrying torpedoes. This tank was cigar shaped and strapped to the torpedo rack. Our aircraft were to carry a new type of torpedo which we had not used before. It carried a duplex contact magnetic pistol designed to pass under the battleship and explode below its soft underbelly. It would also explode on contact with the target. We had agreed that these would be set to run at 27 knots and at a depth of 33 feet. A device consisting of a cable unwinding from a spool had been designed to avoid the weapon porpoising or diving too deeply and sticking on the bottom of the harbour. They had been set to a low safety range of only 300 yards. We hoped that would work better than the Italian ones. Our torpedo men lavished care on them, and we had never suffered a failure in the past. There was a little else to do but have some food and wait. Most of us filled in the time by walking around the quarter deck to watch the other ships. Or was a sight worth viewing? At dusk, it was falling, and presi <coughs> presaging the friendly anonymity of the darkness, we broke away from the main fleet and, accompanied by the third cruiser squadron, Gloucester, Berwick, Glasgow, and York, and four destroyers, we turned at high speed to the north to take up our flying off position, 45 miles west of Celafonia. I'm going to leave it there because, of course, we're doing all sorts of things for Toronto. But this is With Naval Wings by John Wellham. It's his personal account. He's one of the swordfish pilots who does it. Hmm. 
it's a very, very good book. Let's go down this. Osprey, uh, John Luke, good evening. Uh, John Osprey, good evening. How many destroyers is too many destroyers when escorting capital ships? Ideally, you want up to a... You don't want not more than nine per capital ship because it's going to sound strange, but they start to get in the way of the battleship's movement. And that's usually when you start to get destroyers getting sunk by their own capital ships. Just randomly hitting them because they just, the water's too crowded. Dan Freeman, a generation or so ahead of Dewart, you had people like Arthur Wilson, VC, who got his VC in Sudan against the Mahadidis. Except he was an RN captain in his 40s at the time. Well, you know, these things happen. Juno one I, I can never forget the name of one of my friends gave the swordfish at Toronto when he heard there was gas tank in the gas tank. So they were flying Molotov cocktails. Pretty much. Dan Freeman, I suspect I would be chosen to lead attack at Toronto as I had been courting the Admiral's daughter and sleeping with his wife. <laughs> yeah, that would get you something, Nephon. <laughs> uh... John Luke, if you could exchange a capital ship for its weight in destroyers, existing, cl existing class in 1945, what would you give up? Probably it's got to be one of the R-Class battleships. And how many destroyers would that buy me? Probably about 10 or so destroyers, maybe 11. A few more. Let me just remind myself exactly which. I, I'm thinking I'd be getting tribal class. So that'd be the thing. R-Class battleship. By World War II, how much did they weigh? So, standard was roughly 30,000 tons. So, yeah, I could get myself 16 more tribal class destroyers. Yes, please. Give me 32 tribal class destroyers. Then I have some real fun going on for anyone who wants to fight me. Just for one R class, that would be a couple of more. Uh, so I did us. You don't want to give up two. That sounds strange. Giving up more than one gets you into problems because you need those capital ships. Maybe not. Those destroyers are wonderful. They're very useful, but mm, you still need the capital ships. So giving up one for a couple of flotillas of the tribals, I do that. But would the rest of the navy do that? Mm. I wouldn't give up any of the older carriers. But if I'd had more tribals, I might well have had some of those older carriers still in service by 1940, 1941. <sighs> Freaking commander of bloody glorious and courageous. Excuse the French there. Uh, let's see. So that's why, uh, as John Luke says, our class is still useless convoy escorts. So that's why I wouldn't want to give them all up. John Luke, if in 1940 the French fleet in entire in its tiny hands itself over the RN, but refused to crew them, which ship is most of the RF fleet, and how would you crew them? Uh... <laughs> uh, 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 crewing them would be interesting. Uh, mostly, I'd probably be handing them over to people. On if they came over with enough spares and supplies, that's great. If they don't come over with spares and supplies, they're not really much help. If we get their supply depots and get their supplies, then I'd probably hand them over to the Canadians and the Australians. Which sounds strange. 
But I can most easily, because they can take their time to spool up their crews with the help. And the I can more easily spread my own train pre-trained crews with newbies around the other ships. It would still probably rec- take me a while. I would probably be a good year to 18 months before I could use them all and all the ships. But, you know, as I'm also losing ships probably at the time, yeah, it's probably a year to 18 months, but I could probably get there. And I'd use them all. It's a world war. I'm not going to be picky. I can't manufacture ships that quickly. <coughs> hmm. Osprey 28. I currently am in the process of rebuilding the IJN in the game, and I'm deciding on what ships to scrap and which to copy. So that's on. Yes, tribals were great. I agree with you. I prefer an extra squad, uh, squadron of battles if I could. We'd all love some battles, but they, were, they weren't available in 1939. And that was the criteria. They had to be available in 1939. <laughs> John, our class is awesome. They are like the old short guy you see in a pub who looks like he can handle himself and deters bigger young men causing headaches. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jeff Beeler, any good books on the Fleet Air Arm in Europe, 1944 to 45? Guess where um, John Wellham was? Europe. Do you know one where it reminds me of a war spike telling a DD to get out the damn way? Yeah. Joe Starsky. I think we'd assume you were ill or under duress if you hadn't said you get travels. Yeah, that is probably my code word for future. If ever I say I'll answer that question, I don't say get tr- more travels, then I probably am somewhere ill. Bracken Gandalf, one should all arouse. By the time, and I'll be a heretic and ask for LN destroyers instead. Um, I can understand you asking for LN destroyers, and honestly, if I was going to get rid of a second R class, it would be for a, fl- a couple of flotillas of LNM class destroyers because they'd be useful. The reason I want more tribals is because, honestly, I need them for the general purpose escort duties, especially at the beginning of World War II, and because they are the best air defense destroyers you have until about 1941-ish time, so 1949. The reason I don't want to get rid of all the R-Class battleships is because, as was said earlier, you need some of them for a convoy escorts, because otherwise you have to tie down your faster, better, newer battleships with doing that job. <laughs> Angus Donald, do you have names picked out for your 16 new travels? Maybe. Maybe not. Breaking handle, the R-class of pointless one. As I said, they weren't pointless. And let's be honest, again, if you are a surface raider, like the Graf Spey, etc., going after a convoy, hello, there's an R-class battleship. I'm not going anywhere near that, because yes, I've got 11-inch guns, but that's got 15-inch guns. It might not be have the fancy equipment, but it can reach out a lot longer way and can reach me. And it can reach me in ways I don't want to be reached. And it's the same for any German battleship which breaks out. If you're Scharnhorst, Neisenau, anything in 1939 which breaks out and goes, hello world, I'm here to take you on, and there's an R-Class sitting in the convoy, the R-Class doesn't have to be fast. It doesn't have to be super efficient. It just has to be with the convoy. And you draw a great big circle around the convoy and go, okay, my rules of engagement mean I don't want to get damaged. The realities of my operation mean I don't want to get damaged. Convoy with crew, battleship with 15-inch guns. Yeah. I'm going to go for something which looks like a softer target somewhere. Sure, Mac. I would have tried with four and a half inches. I know they were heavier, but single-purpose guns really hurt. 
I actually, the, you see, the thing is, if the four and a half inch mount, double mount, that there was lighter mount that I've been working on had actually been available at that point, they would have probably had the mount fitted. Because they start work on the four and a half inch dual purpose mount a lot earlier. The trouble is the battle class, the reason they have, it's sort of, it's not worked out properly. They've had problems with it, which is why they end up going with the capital ship style mount rather than uh, the DP mount rather than the UD mount, which is l more able to be fitted into these ships. Um, Osprey 28, yeah, hypothetical. If the IJN had the opportunity to place all their heavy cruisers with one to do classes, which do you think they would choose? Cruisers. Uh, probably the most modern. If they could replace all of their ships in one go, they would go with the most modern design they had available because that's the probably the, the, the most re one which most reflects their thinking at the time. But that is kind of hard to say because there are some good classes there. But yeah, I go with the most modern. Dunrick, I am Hammer. Why not give them to the free navies? Because those are even taking you longer to form up. The Australian Navy, the Canadian Navy, the Royal New Zealand Navy, although it's New Zealand Division at the time, are all still in existence at this point and are starting to form up and already have personnel and something to build it around. The free navies have to be built from scratch, mostly from soldiers who've managed to get away from there. It takes longer, and you don't want to give them complicated pieces of equipment. There's a reason you start them off with small ships, unless they bring themselves with them. So, no. Dan Freeman, the R class, keep the German Navy away from things you want to keep them away from, but can't chase them down. Could also do nasty things with any German invasion fleet. Um, yes, you wouldn't really worry about losing the R class if you were dealing with a German invasion fleet either. New IKB 472. How many travel class destroyers would you need to guarantee a kill on both S and G in one engagement? You're wanting me to guarantee a kill. Well, I'll take 32 then. Um... If you had both flotillas, all 16, I'd give them a good chance. It's guarantee a kill is what you're asking. Probable kill, you're probably looking at about eight, and they have a good chance. Because they're fast, they're fairly, they'll be very well handled, aggressive. And as long as they can avoid getting hit by one of the really big shells, they should be okay. Uh, but... It's the guaranteed kill which makes the numbers go up. <laughs> Reese Snow, and being 18 minutes behind real time, yes, some models predict that since Arctic ice is freezing slower than it used to, this winter might bring extreme cold. Hmm, fun times. Sean, uh, Joshua Peters, hello. Um, John Luke, back to the French fleet question. Would the ships worked up by 42, how much of an impact would they make in Medina Asia? Um, what destroyers and cruisers it would be a priority to map? <laughs> Again, it's always going to work from the most, the newest vessels back. So it worked from the newest cruisers, newest destroyers, back to the oldest ones. And what difference would they make? Well, you would probably see a far larger force in the Far East. 4C would probably have a far larger force. You'd probably see also more of a navy in the Mediterranean. More of a blockade going on. Basically, just pick all the areas. There will be far more ships there. Because the Royal Navy would have far more ships to go around. <sighs> What effect would this have on operations? Well, when the Italians get to score their wonderful successes, there'll be far less of an impact on them. Also, you probably find with Crete, etc., and operations like that, the carriers, the 
amphitheater, the battleships would have far more of a destroyer escort, a far heavier destroyer escort going on, which might well improve their air defense. But again, the difficulty is going to be ammunition supplies and maintenance. If you can keep those things going, then you've probably got enough fuel, because let's be honest, the Royal Navy has got a huge amount of fuel stock by the run around the world. Matthew Malecki, hello! Um, have been reading uh, naval anti-aircraft guns and gunnery, and it's a shame the RN didn't keep working on a single mount four and a half inch due to budget and expected requirement response reasons. Yep, it is annoying. John Luke, also they have the full stocks and supplies and everything they could carry away. Well, that, well, as I said, that if you've got that, you're okay. Amazowski, Darren Khan and the Clark Admiralty offered to lend battleship parts. Uh, that battleship Paris, taken from French after capitulation, capitulation to Persian Navy. After considering it, we refused and st uh, stick to destroyers and subs. Yeah, that was far more of the Polish Navy's speed, because they like to be getting in aggressively. Brecken Kendall, on a moonless night, one tribe will do it. Well, uh, well, the thing is, four of them didn't manage. Four of them were hassling Bismarck all night, and they didn't manage to actually sink it. They did torture it all night, but they didn't sink it. So that's why I was going for numbers. Do you know what I am? If the French battleship said yes to join the British, sending two to Canada would be smart because we have French sailors already just training and parts we needed. That was the other thing. You see, the thing is, if you can send the battleships to the Canadians. Cruises, etc., are probably more easy to figure out. But with the, the, who has the largest portion of sailors who are English speaking and French speaking? It's going to be the Canadians. So they're the best ones for that. The Australians would figure it out by probably bashing of a hammer. I have seen Jamie's attempts at DIY. No, he's, that's very good. Being cruel to him now. Um. <sighs> John Luke, ran Manning to Dunkirk class. Would they be more infamous in the end than the tribals? If the Royal Australian had had, Navy had had two Dunkirk class, then 4C would probably have beaten up the entire Japanese Navy. Just let's be honest. That were all the, the RCN Manning to Dunkirk class would be beating up everyone. Sure, Mac. Re French Navy, you also get burn, which, while it's super slow, it doesn't matter if you're launching string bags. It doesn't matter too much. Yeah, and that means you might well have a second carrier at Taranto, which would mean you'd have a far stronger strike, which would keep the Italian fleet out of the out of that particular part of the Italian fleet out of action for longer. And that could have had an impact. It could. It would have been an interesting one. It would have been a very interesting one. <clears throat> mhm mm Let's see There's an interesting debate going on between Stafford Thompson and Juno 191. Let's see. Yeah, pretty much. I have to admit, with World of Warships, my policy tends to be with my battleship as if it's down to 
very, very minimal life left. Um, I do a suicide run and just take someone else out. Might as well. Uh, Mitch Lotes, giving the Paris to the Poles, imagine the way the German zombies would have felt that morning to see a BB coming to coming into view signaling, I am a Pole. Uh, <laughs> uh, that could have been painful. John Luke, what other ships would uh, from occupied countries would have been useful if they had made it dire hands? Norway, Greece? I wouldn't mind a Norwegian Navy. Quite a lot of their ocean going, not their harbour adventures, but I hope a lot of their ocean going destroyers were quite useful. Uh, the Greeks had some fairly interesting destroyers. The Danes had some fairly good destroyers. Yugoslavia, not really. I would not want the Greek battleships, the free dreadnoughts. I wouldn't want them. As Drax says in the, the recent um, Dry Dock episode, they were not updated in any way, shape, or form. <sighs> really. They had had minimal attention put to them. So, next book, Casper John. Technically not an autobiography, because whilst he writes it, his daughter actually puts it all together and publishes it after he dies. So it's Rebecca John. He was writing it, planning on publishing it, and then he didn't complete it. But, um... Yeah. There were altogether 15 pilots in Hermes, 10 RN and 5 RAF. In those days, the whole ship, apart from the purely naval side, was run by the RAF. Naval pilots wanted to make the race ship work, so they conformed to the administration, which was in the hands of a wing commander, supported by a squadron leader who ran the flight deck, all in RAF uniform. But the influx of naval, pilot and naval pilots was beginning to show until... After, uh, until after a year, there were 70% FAA pilots and 30% RAF. Some of the latter did not appreciate the free chair arm, but those who did said this is a damn sight better than the RAF. Casper's description of the FAA at the time explains why. It was a more amicable, happy-go-lucky show than the more strictly disciplined Royal Air Force. While Hermes remained in the South, she was under instructions to keep an eye on the activities of the Cantonese Bolsheviks and to look out for pirates in Bias Bay north of Hong Kong. An activity the British Navy had been engaged in since the early 1800s. The main purpose was to intercept opium roaming. We had little entertainment at BS Bay the other day, Caswell recorded. I discovered and reported a Chinese army straggling towards a burning village, whereat our men beat a hasty retreat to their ships in case they should make a war. I also discovered and photographed what I think was a robber's retreat or pirate's lair. Casper was determined to do as much flying as possible. He and his fellow pilots used as a landing ground a small piece of reclaimed land on the Kowloon side of Hong Kong, Kai Tech Airfield, which today is the International Airport. And here they could would sometimes stay, sleep in mat sheds made out of broad palm leaves. Casper was on a routine flight one day in a ferry free air when suddenly the entire structure of the airplane started vibrate. My passenger tapped me on the shoulder and said, Down the voice tube, your tail is falling off. The actions of the elevator and rudder became spasmatic, confusing my control, and I was faced with two alternatives. The ditch in Hong Kong Harbour, or to risk a lane flight over the heavily populated Kowloon area. I chose the latter, and fluttered my ba back to Kai Tech, using only air lons and tail trimmer. On landing, an examination showed that all four long runs, the main structure of the fuselage, had fractured towards the tail. We were lucky to be alive. Casper's action was considered by his peers to be a remarkable piece of piloting, which saved the lives of three people and is still remembered today by those who witnessed it. Sports continued to occupy the afternoons, which helped to alleviate the boredom. A few games of golf at Fanling until it was turned into an army camp. A great deal of sailing, using the facilities of the yacht club, hockey and tennis, but no rugger. At least while the ground remained rock hard prior to a rainy, the rainy season. I have only seen the sun twice, Casper wrote in March to a girlfriend, Victoria, sister of his friend Peter Reed. Both times when I was flying above the clouds, a thick and solid cloud hangs over the place at about a thousand feet, day and night. Sometimes the southwest monsoon blows for a day, in which case we are all temporarily suffocated. By April, the rains had gathered force. I have never seen such rain. It is quite unbelievable. Accompanied by the most terrific thunder and lightning, there are the only things which cool the air. By May, the ship had become almost uninhabitable due to the foley muggy heat and was having extra large fans installed. The climate was impossible, nor was Casper enamoured of the food. One of the wonders of the world, he bemoaned in a letter to an old school friend, some of the foulest and filthiest muck I've ever seen, and most of it gangrene. 
They carry a small morsel of guts from the market, tied up in nothing but a piece of string. A fish is not considered in, in order for consumption until the smell emits rank with the most nauseating of stinks in the world. I went to a Chinese tavern, rather a high-class one, and took the precaution of filling myself up with sausages before going, so I was hardly hungry when it came to probing about in a dish for a le the least repulsive-looking piece of food. He was soon reduced to a wraith, a mere shadow, he reported to Granny Nanetson. By far the most exciting event for Casper in China that year was his meeting with Peter Reed. They met by the barest of margins when Peter descended from Shanghai just in time to catch Casper before he went away. They sat up until 4am talking. It was magnificent to see him and cheered me more than anything else, Casper told Ethel. Aunt Ursula turned up in March in the P&O liner SS de Banca. What am I to do with her, Casper demanded in alarm. She'll be like a great tigress, filled with an energy surpassing everything. Just think of the way she'll be making plans and getting everything absolutely to time, except herself. I shall have to take her to the top of Tao and Shan to start off with and then walk around the island. On the P&O voyage between Singapore and Hong Kong, Casper had sent an urgent request to Ethel to try and obtain a long list of books. He had evidently been in conversation with a fellow passenger, Arthur Ransom, who was also on his way to China. His little book, The Chinese Puzzle, a puzzle was published ten months later. Ransom recently returned from Russia, where he had been correspondent for the Manchester Guardian, and Casper's list was headed by five of his books, including The Crisis in Russia and Six Weeks in Russia. Other authors on the list were T.F. Powys, Ronald Furbank, Gissing, Donetsky, specifying that he wanted a possessed in French, Gogol, Gorky, Jacques, London, and significantly H.G. Wells, whose predictions of aerial warfare fascinated Hurt Casper. It was planned that Hermes would return home in October to refit, leaving part of her crew behind, including Casper. We shall be put ashore here while she is away, so I'm afraid we shall not see England, the beautiful and cool, for some two years, he wrote regretfully. I shall return surrounded by a bevy of Chinese beauty. However, there was a change of plan, and Casper, after all, accompanied Hermes back to England that September. Now, interesting enough, I would have to say I agree with him on his list of books. Arthur Ransom's books are still worthwhile reading to this day. So if you can get any of the Arthur Ransom books, um, Crisis in Russia and Six Weeks in Russia are both worthwhile reading for contemporary accounts by someone who is a as objective and as informed a bystander as you can possibly potentially get at that time. Sean Mack, the Norwegian destroyers were about 700 tons. Yes, but they'd been great for doing the um, coastal duties for like the uh, the East Coast convoys. Sam Thompson, ah, yeah, thank you. Yes, the war final end is always fun. Today is a good day, the day to die. Prepare to, for ramming speed. Well, it works. And it gets you an extra ship. And you kill Tully. Royal Netherlands Navy had some good ships, but not sure that were, what was in service and what was just in development. The Sleifner class, oh, subpoena class. Let me just check, because we all know what I'm like with spelling. Yeah. Yeah. They are what I was thinking of. They're good little ships. For the way, uh, for the East Coast convoys, frankly, I would have been quite happy to have them. It's not just about having the biggest and best warship. The biggest and best warship is great if you can get them. But if what is available is this, and it will fit that role, and that will free up a bigger, better warship for another role, that is great, too. And that's the thing. Those small destroyers 
They're available at the time. If the Royal Navy had got their hands on them, they'd have been great for the Norwegians to use in the East Coast convoys, freeing up V&W destroyers for other duties. Jeff Hilo, the CVA ones are not cancelled. And what cancelled? What does the Royal Navy look like in 1980? Uh, well, if it gets the CVA ones and manages to get two or three of them, it would have two or three of those, and it would have some Type 82s. Probably about 12 or 14 of them. Which would have been interesting, as, hmm, that would have been good. Bristol Sisters would have been cool. Thomas Vanderbilt. Oh, no. Arthur Ransom. Six Weeks in Russia, 1919. Would love to read that one. It must have been a crazy time. It was, and it's a good book. I've got them... That box, underneath the railway. They're in the box underneath the railway. Hey, King George V. It's brew ships, so it's book reviews. But uh, it's also, I have managed to drink already one of these bottles, and I'm starting on this bottle, so, um, yeah. It's now time for me to use the facilities. Back in a second. Genoa, the size of the Strasbourg class would have probably been able to work out Halifax news, and yeah, they would have been. What would the name been of a third CVO one? Well, the first would have been Queen Elizabeth, the second would have been Prince of Wales, and the third would probably have been Ark Royal. Bing. Hmm. So, Thompson, I'm glad to hear that regarding small destroyers. The Batch 2 Rivers are nice. So, my S59 soup is coming along nicely to support them. Come on. That's good. Don't know. They were used in coastal convoys. I was quite surprised that even Polish destroyers were used to hunt U boats during the inshore campaign the last year of the war. Which focused on coastal. Yes, pretty much anything there was available for that. John, uh, John Luke, another what if, Dr. Clark? Grass Bay is interned in New Uruguay. Then they decide to shell the ship. Would the RN buy it to use, or buy it just to be used, uh, be a destroyer rampage victim by uh, filmed by Pafé? <sighs> Honestly, I doubt the RN would have bought it. They would have probably used the sail to get a good inspection of it. Yeah, they'd have probably used the just sail as a justification for a very good inspection assessment of it to get all the technology they could from it, but they probably wouldn't have bothered to buy it. Let someone else buy it. They could use other things. Plus, there's the fact that if they own it, then where are they going to use it in the world so they don't get it confused with the ones and uh, the ones in German service? And also, they don't. It's eleven inch ammunition, and it's all sorts of things. It's a complicated thing to use. So for the RN to buy one, no. 
Getting whole classes of French ships in 1940, that's a different matter. That's very, very useful because you can use them for things. Getting a single panzer sheaf? No. But nice what if. So they found the only way to work against the snorkel equipped boats was packing the East Coast and North Channel Engine Harbour full of small deciduous corvettes in swooping groups. Yep. Sloops having fun times. Jeff Beeler, I thought the second CBA one was going to be Duke of Edinburgh, as there was no Prince of Wales at the time. So, third one is... No. Sorry. You don't actually have to have a Prince of Wales to have an HMS Prince of Wales. So that might not see that might seem strange, but you don't have to. And <clears throat> Duke of Edinburgh would not have been named for a carrier. It go it's named after our sovereign head of state, heads of state, i.e. monarchs, or occasionally art things like Arc Royal attributes. So and it would have been Arc Royal. Rather like when they did the the reason why the third of the Invincible class is called Arc Royal literally is because of that. What would the air groups have like? Would Clapp have been the captain? Probably Michael Clapp would have, well, have, could well have ended up captaining an aircraft carrier. Air groups would probably have been Buccaneers and Phantoms. The question is what they would have done for the fighter after the Phantom was to be phased out and the Buccaneer was to be phased out. Might well have been FA-18s by 1980. Well, late 1980s. Probably beginning in 1982, probably still Buccaneers and probably still Phantoms. With. They might have changed the Gannets. They might have upgraded from Gannets to something more viable. They probably would have done, in fact. Um, let me just check something. When did the Americans sell the French Hawkeyes? Yeah, they'd have probably been carrying Hawkeyes. Uh, let's see. By that point... Probably, probably E two Cs or E two B. Definitely E two Bs. Maybe even E two Cs. By that point, yeah. That would have been the main interesting thing. It would have been having the airborne early warning, as I point talk about a fair number of times. Airborne early warning would have been a big thing in the Falklands if they'd had it available. Barry Peter, six weeks in Russia is free on Kindle, it seems. Cool, get it then. You really do want it. Six weeks in Russia. If it's the one by the gentleman who just said, Alpha Ransom, it, you really do want it. That for him. Re, uh, Clark, re second hand grass bait. Buy it and gift it to the free of Polish Navy. Paint in bright colours to distinguish them from other Deutschland class? Nah. Melanie, 16040. Hello, Melanie. Hello, and hello, Brad Pitter. I haven't said hello to both of you. Um, for the iron to buy one what exactly? One grass bay. Thompson, regarding grass bay, uh, would the question, would the evaluation lead to the building of a nine point of the 9.2 heavy cruisers as to have a better platform for future proofing upgrades? Potentially. 
Uh, the RN was quite keen on the 9.2, but they were going for the 6 inches because they were able to mass produce them, and they couldn't really see a threat that a group of 6 inch cruisers couldn't deal with in the cruiser role. Uh, but maybe. Schumach, Deutschland, uh, certainly if they'd realised that they were going to end up divesting of battleships so soon after World War II, you would have probably seen 9.2 inch cruisers built to provide the Royal Navy with some kind of heavy firepower core going into the future as the world evolved. Schumach, Deutschland class will be a nice coastal battleship for someone, and it also has a ridiculous range because the Germans decided they wanted a convoy road of it. E possibly. Again, I'd say Argentina or Brazil were most likely buyers. Thomas Vanderbilt, uh, they did send inspection teams to get photos of the ra ra Raiders and such sent by R.V. Jones on Churchill's orders. Since 1939, it was the only one that had radar, but no idea if it got aboard. Uh, officially, it's the American report which the British used to get it after getting aboard. Unofficially, mm, there might have been some British gentlemen with the American, but, you know, they're all speaking English. Juno, stop trying to let us try it. I don't know. RN tribals gained from the Decomar class. Names could have been Vasco Kiss, Chelsea Smile, Mil uh, They actually. The interesting thing is the British, the Royal Navy does get a, do a list of tribes. And there's some tribal names from the first tribal class which weren't used in these two flo in the first two flotillas, which would have probably been reused. And they also have a list of new names to get into, etc., for the tribe. So if they had 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 built 32, which they were prepared to, because they were at one point considering buying more tribals than LMs, they could well have done it. They had the names ready to go. Indeed, it was sloop time in 1944-45. It's shocking what they used to pack the sea racks on. Uh, the, uh, seeing the fact that they had so little effect in coastal waters, they needed everything afloat for ammo. Yeah. Greg Southie, if the UK had had sea they might have done it as a navalized tornado. I... <sighs> That's a lovely idea, but I don't think it would have happened while the Buccaneer was still in service. I think while the Buccaneer and the Phantom were still available, they'd have kept the Buccaneer and the Phantom. Blackburn Buccaneers. Don't know. Yep, found six weeks in Russian. Link for free. Can I put it here? Please do. Please put it here and also put it into Discord as well, if you can. Sad Thompson, uh, what was my thoughts? How so? If by some chance the war was prolonged, how long until Mustache Man had V2s mounted warships in your mind? I'd say 46, 47. I'd say, considering he got rid of the big surface ships, probably. It would depend if they suddenly got interested in the big service ships as a way to get those launchers closer to the UK. Then maybe. But no. Hello, Carl Harmon. Do you know, Dan from do you know, it's soccer. It, it is soccer, except it isn't. It's football. I don't see a role for Tornado for Carrier. Um, the Carrier is when you've got Blackburn, Black, Buccaneers, and Phantoms. That's the thing. If you've got them available, you know. Oh. Germac, Steph Thompson, V2s were alcohol and liquid oxygen fueled. Were very bad for shipboard use. Ship would need to have liquid oxygen production plant on board. I agree with all that, but there again, this is that particular country in World War II, and they were. This is also the country which has the great mark for Panzer, 
and still goes on to produce the Mark V, which is fairly good upgrade, yeah, and then decides to work on an even bigger and even more complicated one. Rather than just going back to the Mark IV, upgumming it and making it slightly easier to maintain, which would probably allow them to outproduce pretty much everyone on tanks, considering their initial advantage. John Luke, CV01 gets some F14s. Who is more scared? Are for the rest of the world? Both. And in answer to Dan Freeman's question, the RFA would have put Rolls Royce engines in the F14 as part of the build thing. So, yeah, they'd have been decent engines. Angus Sonner, why didn't the Russians take better care of the ships they were lent in Model 2? They took good care of the cruiser, but honestly, the battleship was beyond their abilities to care for. They didn't have the maintenance facilities. They didn't really have the facility things to care for it. And if you can't do the big stuff, then the little stuff becomes increasingly difficult to get to and use. Jeff Eli, in 1946, age 16, Sean Connery enlisted in the Royal Navy as an AA gunner, trained at Portsmouth. His first ship was HMS Formidable. After three years, he was medically discharged due to an ulcer. Ouch. Juno 191. Also, would it be bad to have ships named after football teams? I.e. Manchester United Act? I, I could see competition and battle fights. This is why we don't have ships named after, uh, after football teams. Carmen, uh, Doctor, in Drafical's Drive Talk, he said the Royal Navy doubled its size model two compared to World War One personnel. Wise, would we have seen a similar size Navy if the World War One Germany had been more of a threat? I understand it was big threat, but once bottled up, Germany ca it couldn't get out, and I like World War Two. Yes, and also there's the extent that World War One, whilst it is a global naval war, is far more of a. Let's be honest. You don't have huge convoys going, taking troops out to fight in Singtao and the Far East. You have the troops coming to the Middle East. You have some fighting going on in Africa, but limited. And you have most of the fighting going on in Europe. So you don't have to have the global war that you have in the Second World War, which is why the Navy in World War II is about 800,000 strong. The Navy in World War I is about 400,000 strong. Plus, there are other sort of things in that you have Royal Marines commandos, all sorts of other Royal Navy personnel, the growth in size of the fleet air arm, the land installations for the fleet air arm, all these things create a far bigger organization. Yeah, we're not. Uh, honestly, Germany's production of equipment would take far too long to get into in World War Two. It would be a, like a four-day tour project. Actually, though, no, if you want to suggest that for one of the future long works for me and the Bilge Pumps team, because we are we have got a list of projects. We're doing Toronto, we're doing HMS Sydney, and we're looking at other things to do, as a, which we're doing as a threesome because. There are some things which we think will be better, better served and far more interesting if we do them as a group. Because we are do the historically inspired but current affairs podcast. So we thought we'd do some history inspired specials in terms of video show shows. Greg Stassi, if you're getting... Well, the trouble is... Uh, Greg Stassi, for the same reason Tornadoes replace Phantoms in the RF age and equipment. If you're getting for the RF anyway, naval variant makes sense. I do agree, but if you're getting them for... And this is the thing. By the point at which you'd be buying the Tornadoes, you also might be needing to replace the Buccaneers and the Phantoms, in which case you'd probably buy the F-18s. Because what's going to be cheaper... Buying a American carrier-based aircraft and a carrier des aircraft designed for carriers from the get-go, or trying to rebuild do a, another version of basically a modernized version of the Seafire, where you take an aircraft which is designed for land operations and has all the structures and everything around that, and have to basically redesign the entire airframe 
all the hard points, all the concussion points, all the suspension points from the ground up, literally, in order to get it to land on the carrier. In the end, they'd have ended up buying the F-18s. So once the Phantoms went and the uh, Buccaneers went, it would be in an F-18 fleet. So that's probably what the Royal Navy would be having now if they'd had CVA once. So you probably have had free CVA ones. They'd probably be in service till about 19, 2020. Probably done about 40 years service. 40, 40, uh, you probably had 40 years service and then you had the Queen Elizabeth coming in. And again, they'd probably be having the current Queen Elizabeth, the new class, they'd be coming in, who knows what they'd be called. But they would probably be again be Katabar and they would have the flight group would go over. Probably would still be getting joint strike fighters to replace them. So we'd have probably not gone the Super Hornet route. We'd have gone the F-35 waiting route. Trent Alenko, I just love General S S Field Marshal, not General, Field Marshal, A.J. Slim's memoir. His balancing of logistics and the human side of language and cu culture of Imperial military units is unmatched. It is very cool. Uh, Jeff Bieler, what plans are a plane to replace Phantoms and Buccaneers on the CVA in the 1990s? I think I've just answered that one. F-18s, I reckon. Um, Jeff Bieler, how integrated is the F-35 647 squadrons? As I read that this commanding uh, commanders are in, incredibly integrated, the F-35 squadrons are incredibly integrated. Carl Harmon, uh, I love the uh, I love the guest this week. So many good stories. Can't wait to see him back. Also, could we see a behind the scenes released each week to uncut? No editing, just raw naval geek out. Ooh, I might do that. Do you know what I have? Bilge pumps on the sinking of Repulse and Prince Wales. That's just that would be just be painful. The amount of anguish that would be in the room. <sighs> Carl Hammond, can I ask what the CVA-1 was? Um, sorry. It was the planned Royal Navy Catabar carrier, which was supposed to come into service after the Eagle and Ark Royal uh, were retired, but it was cancelled, and then Eagle and Ark Royal were decided with the East of Suez decision. So pretty much they cancelled the carriers and in the 1960s. Yes, but if the RN had an unbroken line of CVs, then Tornado could have been designed... With it could have been, but I doubt it would have been. Because Tornado is designed not as a British project, but as a joint European project, and we'd be the only ones who'd want it. Unless you manage to keep the French inside the Tornado project, which they don't, they go off and design their own, you would have had the British have to fund the entire thing for the carry integration themselves. So the choice of Britain would have been to fund the entire carrier integration themselves or get Tornado for the Royal Air Force and get F-18s for the Royal Navy. They would have gone for the latter. Besides, we always like to buy both British and American aircraft. Having noticed, we always design our thing between the European build and the American one so that we've got a foot in both camps for our aviation industry. It's what we do. So if you're buying Tornado for the land-based aircraft, you would can guarantee we'd be buying Hornets for the sea-based one. Okay, all right, all right. I will get on to the next book. There are there are 12 books to get through. So. I am being rather slow getting through books today. I'm asking, answering quite a lot of questions. Now, why have I got Madeleine Albright here? Because, frankly, she's interesting. 
There is a sort of high point in American service in about late 1980s, early 1990s, where you have some genuinely very interesting, very capable people becoming secretaries of state, secretaries of defense, and all these things. I'm still not sure about some of the presidents, but some of the, the, the people who were actually serving them were very, very interesting. And for those who want to think that I am... Very, very pro us. I would say the America uh, that America's two female Secretary of States, that's been Albright and two of their female Secretary of States, two out of three, and Condoleezza Rice were some of the best Secretary of States that have ever served America, in my opinion. As for Yas Arafat, he could only be described as a dogged and unpredictable. Sometimes he would do one cheek, sometimes two. And at other times, both cheeks, the forehead and the hand. He also tried to kiss President Clinton, who towered over above him. So Arafat ended up laying his head beneath the president's chin. One of the more unusual displays of cultural diplomacy would occur at the annual meeting in the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Asian. Perhaps for the same reason that karaoke stand up in Japan, the Asians love to put on a show. In fact, they expected every delegation to perform a song or skit or dance routine, starring its foreign minister, as entertainment for the final dinner. Some countries took the event quite seriously and rehearsed for months. Others recruited professionals. Historically, American Secretary of States have been extremely reluctant participants. My initial reaction to the Asian tradition was, this must be out, they must be out of their mind. However, I soon discovered that I was, at heart, a ham. For the 1997 Asian meeting in Malaysia, our embassy had drafted lyrics to the tune of Mary Had a Little Lamb. The words were witty, but the song was just not me. So on the long plane ride to Kuala Lumpur, I dumped a young woman for a, or an older one. Evita replaced Mary. I made my stage entrance in a long black dress with a crimson lipstick, a shawl, and a large flower in my hand, a hair. With my diplomatic team backing me up, I serenaded the crowd with Don't Cry For Me, Asianis. The performance was received with great whoops and cheers. I would have become insufferable if one envoy had not to the press. Madeline was very sassy, the new Madonna, even though she can't sing to save her life. The next year, I was determined to top my own act, which meant I needed help. In Malaysia, Evgeny Premakov had not sung, but rather used a whistle to uh, direct his delegation, who sang Dressed as Sailors in the Russian Black Sea Fleet. I praised his performance shamelessly and suggested that we secretly join forces for the 1998 Asian meeting in Manila. Between discussions on the Balkans and Iraq, we came up with a story about star-crossed lovers we called the East-West Story. The night before the performance, we held a raucous rehearsal in my room, the Douglas MacArthur Suite at the Manila Hotel. Primakov was the Tony character, backed up by his gang, the Ruskies, while I had Natalie Wood's role reinforced by my gang, the Yankees. The next day, our staffs put out word there would be a rumble that night, but few got the references until the Russians and Yankees took the stage with snapping fingers and menacing looks. I entered from left wearing an embroidered barong blouse, singing the most beautiful sound I've ever heard, Yegemi, 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 to which Primakov replied in his thick Russian accent, Madeleine Albright, I just met a girl named Madeleine Albright. This parody too was a hit, and more importantly, helped ease our relations with the Russians at a difficult time. Musical diplomacy. It's good. Look, Madeleine Albright is a good one to look up. She has a very interesting, realistic approach to politics, to international relations, but does also have some idealism there. So she's a study in contradictions, and she actually does her work well, which is rare, and she gives a fairly candid book, which is even rarer. Jeff Beeler, citing Wikipedia, four planned and had CVO 1 and CVO 2 being built, it is likely they would have been named HMS Queen Elizabeth and HMS Duke of Edinburgh. There is a... How do I put this? No. Yes, I know, the rumour and there are strong ideas going around that it would have been HMS Duke of Edinburgh, but for an aircraft carrier, a flagship of the Royal Navy, to be named after... And this is, sounds so cerebral, and I do not mean this in the way this will come out, because he is one of those great institutions of Britain, and he did serve World War II and all those things. For someone as comparatively low down the rankings as the spouse of the monarch would be extremely unusual, without precedent, and unlikely. Okay? 
So despite him having been an Avos, he would have more likely been the sponsor. But it would have been Prince of Wales or potentially Ark Royal or all sorts of other things. But it would not have been Duke of Edinburgh. And I doubt there would have been more than three built. Despite their dreams for four, there would have been more than three. Because there just wouldn't have been the money given. The Panzer IV, I did... Uh, Calm Gasper, sorry, the Panzer IV wasn't enough for the Soviet Britain. I did say an upgunned Panzer IV. And possibly simplified engine, so you could have numbers of them. Jemek, with CVA-1, there are also, may also be more sources of, with building radar-equipped carrier-based version of the Jaguar. Uh, doubtful. Ja <laughs> Plus, I am to an extent competing with Drac today, because he did a 4-hour and 60-minute dry dock. Uh, right, Carmen, if you get the mighty jingles on bilge pumps, may I suggest you go do a Gulf War special? I believe he served on HMS Manchester. Possibly. Hmm. Paul Baswick, Grass Bay, if not the RN, who might? Uh, as I said, I think Argentina or Brazil. Sean Mack, Naval Diplomacy or Musical Diplomacy? Which wins? Probably Naval Diplomacy, but if you can do some Musical Diplomacy alongside a Naval Diplomacy, that would that'd be even better. Carl Gasman, Rehorn itself a Phantom, or dust off the Hawker P141145, the Supersonic Harrier Project, make a joint deal with uh, with McDonnell Douglas? That would be tempting, if you could get it done. I go to work at the university which uh, I, I I work at the university which uh, it was where it was part of the site is where it, that was actually developed and they are they have pictures of it all over the place. It's quite cool. Greg Stassi, logically, Duke of Edinburgh would have been an escorting cruiser for the CV, like Queen Mary was a battlecruiser. And Queen Mary for a battlecruiser caused a huge furor. They did accept it, but, you know. It, it, it caused a furor. It was not It was not a fun time. Melanie 16040, Dr. Clark, what history do journalists have of ever simplifying things? They don't. That's the problem. They do not. Sure, Mac. Panzer IV with torsion and long 75mm would have been a 75mm would have been a good medium tank. Yeah, that's pretty much what I was thinking. Or, you know, that'd fairly work. So if you have only got five barrels of fuel, where would you put them? A Tiger or a Panzer IV? Depends. Has the Panzer IV recently come from the um, factory? And have I managed to check it all over? Oh, the Panzer IV, a Tiger? Uh, hang on, though. If it's a Tiger one, no. I'm going straight for the Panzer IV. If it's a Tiger two. And we're sure it's working. I'll put it in Tiger Two. But if it's a, if it's a Tiger One, I'll put it in the Panzer Four and take that. I'll be more likely to be still be driving it at the end of the day. Oh. Don't worry, Drac is still able to speak. Just about.
Now, I should add Now, as far as I know it, this book only has four copies available on Amazon and doesn't have anyone else there elsewhere. But this is a special book. It's called The Making of a Civil Servant, and it's written by Lady Murray, who is the wife. Again, rather like Rebecca Johns putting it together after her father died, Lady Murray's putting it together after her husband died. And her husband is someone very, very interesting. Her husband is Sir Oswin Murray who was the Secretary of the Admiralty, 1917 to 1936. I.e., for 19 years, 19 very crucial years, he was the most senior civil servant in the Admiralty. Basically, he runs the Admiralty. Other people come and go, but he runs the Admiralty. The official background of the picture of post-war days has been rather surprisingly cleared of its multiplicity of detail by the word confidential. Although Oswin, of course, disclosed no secrets, it was impossible that I could fail to follow and know a little bit more of the inner working of the government and the Admiralty machine than my fellow general public. Instance that it was served as introduction to an amusing stir story of illustrating my husband's mental equipment proved to be highlights on some matters where ret reticence is desirable. I often thought that the reticence of the Admiralty was more noticeable, if where all it, all is most, like some can be more, when misstatement and misinterpretation were being published to its discredit. No proof that you are right will convince a man who wants to believe you're wrong. You only advertise a slander by contradicting it, were Aswin's invariable answers to my reiterated, why don't you put it in the papers? It was early in 1932 that Mr. Alexander Flint died after a very long illness. His death was a great loss to the Admiralty as a whole, and particularly to Oswin Murray, who had looked on him as his probable successor, and had given him all the chances for experience that he could with this end in view. It was agreed that Alexander Flint had not lived to see his services fully recognised. Since 1920, when the government decided to make all heads of department financially responsible for their departments, Murray had held in contemplation a reorganisation of the Admiralty Civil Staff. This was set in foot in 1929, but could not go forward till 1932 when the retirements that had been automatically occurring made it possible to abolish the office of Accountant General, which had been an anachronism since 1921. Murray said that this was the biggest thing he had done since the war. Mr. W.A.T. Shortrew of the Secretariat, with a small committee consisting of Mr. Sidney Bynes, also the Secretariat, now Sir Sidney, and Mr. Wilfred Med, Assistant to the Accountant General, drew a proposal for merging the Accountant General's Department into the Secretariat. And with a few of Murray's masterly touches, these proposals were put in practice in 1932, the organization being known in the Admiralty as the merger. The chief changes brought about by the merger, says Mr. Shorto, were simplification of procedure and consequent reduction of work, duplication of work being eliminated. This led to economies in staff. After the scheme had been in force somewhat time, other reforms emerged from it, such as the decentralization to the home ports of welfare work records. At first, the merger appeared to threaten the prospects of a number of officials in the old Accountant General's Department, and certain artificial steps were taken to meet and provide against genuine grievances. Ultimately, fears of interference of this kind were gradually dissipated, and when it became necessary to expand, it was, as Murray had foreseen, much easier to accomplish this without confusion or overlapping than it had been in 1914. Since the war wrote the Navy in March 1936, his job has been equally difficult, but... While he has always worked for efficiency, he has been very vigorous in standing out against cuts which have lost sight of the proper working of the department. Efficiency here evidently means economy. The confidence with which Murray would, uh, could rely on those who worked under him for the good of the service is shown by the fact that of those whose careers appeared to be threatened by the reorganisation, none were more nearly concerned than the men who formed the little committee to arrange it. Murray now calculated that the saving he had made for the count and country entirely on his own initiative would pay many times over for the salary he would receive for his 40 years service and his pension, 
however long he might live to enjoy it. It amused and pleased him to think that the work he had done would do for the country would never cost her one penny. Speaking of distinguished old boys at the City of Oxford School, the Reverend N N N. E. Kent, OBE, former naval chaplain, said that Olson Murray was regarded in the Navy as the best permanent secretary the Admiralty ever had. Surely he was also the cheapest. Besides the legitimate work of the office, all sorts of things people wrote to him about all sorts of things. A little collection of letters dated 1932 is interesting by its variety. Some of the letters may have been kept for a collection of autographs that I began when he was a private secretary, and which I only remembered when Oswin did. Why the other letters uh, escaped destruction, I do not know. Mr. Hannett says that Oswin Murray's office methods were very orderly, but at home, though essentially a neat worker, he really needed a study, however small for himself, and this he never had. When I was able to arrange this for him, he was quite indignant at the idea of being turned out of the drawing room, where two large writing desks made it comfortable from work, and yet feel leisurely. It is a very, very interesting book. Okay. Carmen Gasman, I, I still have more than one hour of it suspended. I have two hours of it suspended at the moment. I only managed to get two hours up. Carmen, I have a dream of ha them having two to three key class carriers, two invincible size carriers, so ASO low intensity, two amphibious ships, and an actual escort. I know it's gen it's unrealistic. Government would never do it. Yeah, it's a nice dream, though. Hmm. So it's fine. And besides, for defending, you need infantry, and there lay the problem. They couldn't protect the flanks of armoured bra breakthroughs anymore. This happened with Stalingrad curse, no plugging holes. It's always trouble having no inf not enough infantry, and not having enough stuff to move the infantry forward. That's the thing. What people forget in World War II is the sheer amount of trucks that the British and Americans were using to move infantry forward, to move supplies forward, and that they had. The Germans never had enough trucks by a long way. Alright, back in a second. But I have got one advantage tonight in that I've already taken the fluffy research assistant for his walk. So, no, it should be okay. In theory, he says. In theory. In practice, who knows. Um, all right. <clears throat> Well, best work. If we had big carriers, the iron would have got F-14s. I doubt it. I think they'd have probably... The trouble is with the F-14, that would have been lovely to replace the Phantoms, but not the Buccaneers. So I think we'd have probably gone F-18s. Maybe Super Hornets. Maybe. Man, in I mean, what, during the invasion of France, only like 10% of German forces were mechanized? E e roughly. General 9191, as David Webster has said about the brothers, we have Ford and General fire uh, effing motors. Yeah.
Darren, I'm feeling in light of lockdown. You've placed in number 10. You must have solved COVID and recalibration. You can't cut back military and it's just improve if possible. How you do it? Mm. It's going to be an interesting time, let's say this. Um, I have to admit, though, uh, one thing. I'm very glad that I've got this going on. Because, you know, it's it, it's interesting. Actually, before I get into next book, and I will get into the next book soon, I had a really interesting conversation this week. Because A, I was doing the A-level politics shooting all time. And then Monday and Tuesday, I taught online for the universe, for a university. And then Friday evening, I had a fun little chat with a university I was considering writing an application for, but I rang up. I'd made an appointment to ring up um, uh, someone in the department to talk about the application because it was for online teaching uh, military history. But frankly, I can do that as well as naval history quite happily. I'm, I'm quite good at land warfare and I can do that. Talking away and they go and, and they said, what online teaching experience do you have? Well, I point to the YouTube channel. I point to all the work I do. For us. Oh, that's not really enough. I said, sit there and go. What do you mean it's not enough? Well, yes, you've used MS Teams, you've used Zoom, and you've delivered all these lectures, and you do YouTube as well. But that's not really enough. No, no, no. We expect you to have done YouTube, MS Teams, Zoom, and there was an Apple program as well he was talking about. I was sitting going, why? Why are you running? Oh, yes, we run the lectures. It depends on which module's been set up, what the module leader wants it to be run on. So I'm not sure if I'm going to actually worry about doing the application, as apparently I don't have enough experience. I should probably do it. I probably I will do it. I've got it halfway done. But if they're going to expect you to have done all that, there's I'm not buying an I'm not buying an Apple computer just to do one module one module's worth of teaching. That seems pointless and expensive. And I don't know how the students keep up with it. Carmen, I'm feeling mean in light of lockdown. You are placed in number 10. You must solve COVID and recover nation. You can't cut back military initiatives and prove if possible. How do you do it? Solve COVID. It all depends on the level of economic harm you're prepared to do, and if you want to really sort of, the, 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 I think the big trouble at the moment is that people are not sure what the solution is going to be. I think I wouldn't keep schools open. I would probably send all all, all the school kids other than Year Eleven, Year Thirteen, and those whose both parents are key workers or in otherwise can't stay at work from home home and be teaching online for them i would send all university students who don't need to be in labs home to teach online i'm sorry that i would um <sighs> Honestly, I would say you can only travel for work. And if you do travel for work, if you come back into the country or come into the country, you have to isolate for 16 days. You have to be tested on entry with a 15 minute test, and then you have to be isolated for 16 days. Do both. That would tell you if people really needed to do it. If they need, really need to go, they'll, they'll go. Still, go, They can still go. If they don't really need to do it, they'll find other ways. Um, and I would basically suggest that if you were to make sure you're isolating for those 16 days well meet the uh, meet the, uh, the the foot bracelet sort of thing would be going on there sorry for the foot popping up um how and i would probably do a full shutdown on the country for at least probably like their government's doing it would be about four weeks and it would be completely mandatory with people in uh, 
you having to you only leaving home for essential things like shopping etc uh i wouldn't do what the welsh government is doing which is the essential items and i wouldn't really cut any but government spending in, in, in nice way i would start boosting government spending i would probably start using money to start investing in infrastructure projects to grow the economy post covid so things like making sure broadband rolled out to make things easier probably some railway projects i'd be boosting up and i might well start ordering some uh, some military stuff to start getting that part of the economy going um that'd be sensible that'd be the sensible things but you know but that's just me I am just a historian. Kings are obliterally mentioned the Canadian military pattern cut rocks. They were cool. Don't find again about trucks with twenty two percent to five percent fuel rations. For also been trucks. Uh the Soviets can't even use cavalry and with great effects, they just dismounted the horses after about a mile out. Sensible. Well, that's right. If Britain had replaced Phantoms with F-14, then Tornado AD ADV is still born. Well, yes, probably because the RF ended up getting Phantom as well at that point. Uh, lovely be a Dream Fleet, Stafford Thompson. Do you know what I know? Oh, happy you do this for it. So far, I've learned a lot more, a lot from you and Drac. Also, it's kept my sanity in check. Well, that's one of the reasons I do it. I literally having these talks, doing this naval history stuff with you guys, keeps my it helps give me something to focus on, something to work out my week by. Um, it also helpfully allows me to keep my indulging my books, book habit. And here's the thing: I am very happy because the Amazon storefront has recently earned me seven pounds, which I've used as credit to buy to a put towards a book. Of course, it's me. And rather than taking it, they only got credit, Amazon credit for a book, which is good. Um, comes from Amazon. Academic institutions have totally unrealistic expectations, and they wonder why we are in so much trouble. Yeah, they do. Carlton, Sean Mac, how many teachers have a YouTube and a regular user? I did have no idea. Carmen, Dr. Clark, apply, you got nothing to lose, but more to the point, who uses Apple to watch it? It's like everything else is simple and easy, and actually, I don't. I, they have an Apple based version of MS Teams, apparently, somehow. I, I haven't even heard of it. This is the thing. And I work with about five different universities, and I still haven't heard of it before then. So acting like New Zealand government, then? Probably. Honestly, to an extent, that's the only way. Because the trouble is, but you will be accepting that there's going to be economic damage. There will be economic damage to the, if you do that. That is, the big, that is the big thing. You have to accept that. And it goes against some of my principles, because I'm actually more a laser-fair government as anyone else. So I'd like to sort of keep government to the... I always say the ideal for government is not a small government or big government. The ideal for government is to have exactly as much government as you need for that time. No more, no less. In the middle of World War II, you probably need a bigger, slightly more reaching government than you do in the middle of peace. <sighs> Caledron. Uh, hello, Caledron, for starters. And I work in the supermarket. I really hope we don't have the no essentials that can be solved thing. I do too. That's just me. J. 
Gentlemen, well, in Poland, they finally send all the, all the children older than 10 for online teaching. I teach in both primary and high school. Both use Teams. That makes sense. Teams is the one which works. I hate using Zoom, honestly. People can give themselves their own names. It's, it makes running a register very difficult. But that's just me. Anyway, book habit is a very terrible and expensive things. And then they have Black Friday. Afterwards, I look in my bank account and go, mm, it's not good. And I have to say, uh, Dr. Alan Freeman, I found a combination of charity shop and then local independent bookshops with a sale area. See? My bag was very heavy for coming home. Yes, I've had that happen to me a few times. All right, and let's see. I'm at 2.26, nearly 2.27. Okay, we'll call this 0.227. Right. So, Waging Modern War by General Wesley Clark. I returned to the States that week, where I testified before the Senate Armed Services Committee and met with Secretary Cohen and General Seraldson. Once again, I was in the Secretary's big office, centered on the, on the Pentagon River entrance, seated around the small circular table. I knew that Cohen and Shelton were both caught up in the problems of the airstrikes, but I also sensed that they had no full appreciation of the overall NATO problem in the region. So I began to share some of my concerns. If we have to strike, Mr. Secretary, I began, here are the other problems that will be facing us. I went through the disposition of the Allied force in Macedonia, a real conglomerate, including our own 350 troops, intermingled with the UN contingent, with no one really in charge, the considerations for the safety of the native personnel in Bosnia, the problems of the Yugoslav Navy in the Adriatic, the difficulties of moving additional NATO forces through Greece to reinforce our positions in Macedonia, and so on. Secretary Cohen listened closely, he seemed supportive, and when I left I felt good about the meeting. There was no time for a quick visit to Macedonia to see Mike Jackson at the headquarters he had established for the ARC, ARRC at a shoe factory in Skopje. Even more important was the opportunity to visit again with President Gilagov and his government. With each trip to Skopje, I claimed admiration for the tough man who was the Macedonian president. Gilagov was a courageous and canny survivor. We were counting on him because it was obvious that the real weak point for NATO would be its dependence on Macedonia. Macedonia was our base. Without it, we have no ground access into Kosovo. Without its airspace, we would have more restricted flight corridors into Serbia. As we sat around Gilagov's conference table and discussed the issues, I wanted to convey firmness and confidence. He was attempting to show the same to me, and also keeping a wary eye on what might become his country if things went awry for NATO. Fifty years from now, he was saying, Serbia will still be there, but will NATO? He was probing to determine our resolve. He would dole out Macedonian support based on what he saw as NATO's likelihood of success. I will not permit you, General Clark, to use the soil of Macedonia for attacks into Yugoslavia, he said. I could tell his words were chosen deliberately and carefully. He was giving me permission to use the airspace anywhere I, any way I chose. This removed one of my final concerns. I knew we would be able to come in over Albania and through the sea, uh, but Macedonia gave that uh, that much wide access to the targets of Serbia that we wanted to be able to strike. It was, it was enough for now. Mima, as Rambouillet, the negotiations had terminated, and would not be resumed. The Albanians had signed, but the Serbs had refused. This set up the conditions that called for the airstrikes. Now we had to face the reality on the ground in Kosovo. My first concern, uh, there was uh, there was no the safety of the more than 1,000 unarmed verifiers operating under the aegis of the OSCE. They attempted to leave, I wondered, would Serbs permit their departure to take hostages? In that case, uh, what were our capabilities to go in on the ground to rescue any of them? There was no good answer for the problem of hostages. We had to hope that, they were, that we weren't called. The force available was simply inadequate for any task requiring a real forced entry hostage rescue attempt. To help get things moving, I called the US ambassador to the OSCE, who put me in touch with the OSCE chairman in office, and Norwegian Foreign Minister Kurt Volbeck. Mr. Volbeck then assured me that he was planning to withdraw the OSCE verifiers on Saturday, March 20th. On that day, remarkably, the whole mission came out with no hostages taken and no losses. But as soon as the pull-up began, the Serb military and police initiated their renewed ethnic cleansing of the Kosovo Albanians. 
By Saturday afternoon, March 20th, the international TV networks were carrying video of Albanian refugees streaming barefooted from the village, uh, village of Srebrenica. Time had almost run out for diplomacy, and the final planning for the strikes were underway. The first problem was the readiness of the aircraft themselves. Most, but not all, of the aircraft had arrived at the pre uh, predesignated bases. But the US aircraft carrier that we had factored into our planning earlier had now been withdrawn, sent to a higher priority tasking in the Persian Gulf. We would make up the shortfall with land based aircraft. The interesting thing about this book, as I often say, is if you read it along with General Jackson and then you watch some of the videos of James Blunt discussing his time when he was leading the troops who actually went into Kosovo and were on the airfield with the Russians, um, you realize that General Jackson is most of the time quite a thoughtful, well-mannered, sensible individual. But you also realize that he was under a tremendous amount of stress. And frankly, a lots of decisions. So, you know, you can understand some of this stuff going wrong. Do you know what I'm on? That I'm not going to repeat that, but I agree I do think so. I don't think they really wanted me. They kept talking about their PhD students. Um, Plebiscide. Sadly, you didn't have the Amazon link when I spent £253 uh, three pounds on books you recommended. <laughs> I'm just glad you spent the money on the books. The books are good. Come on, Dr. Clark. Any chance that ha they have someone they would rather and trying to use a small excuse to keep you out? He, as I said, they kept talking about the PhD student. Thomas Vanderbilt. That's like telling Cash or Chuck Berry you can't perform because you got the wrong guitar brand. Yeah, pretty much. That's life, though. So, Thompson, regarding your teachers and platform, on here I follow three doctors, two profs, and four geologists. Cool. Come on, that's wrong. It's not that bad with no essentials. No, no non-essentials. It's stuff like loads of luxury clothes and clothing, which should have not for sale unless you visibly need it. Books are Amazon, but mostly stuff available. I have to admit, um, everyone seems to be short of toilet roll at the moment. Um, my tip for toilet roll, and this I have to put down to my wonderful girlfriend, who unfortunately didn't make the recording of Bilge Pumps due to her being a very good friend of someone else, but we will get her on to Bilge Pumps is go to Amazon. Do you know what I'm on? If you think it's bad for books, wait for the World of Warships, Black Friday, and Carousel Sales. People spend so much of Santa Claus uh, crates of Korean ships and not even funny. I, I, I can't understand that myself. Although, there again, I never really have that much money to spend on things like that. I enjoy those games. I do enjoy World of Warships, but I don't think I'm going to be buying any premium ships anytime soon. Um... Plebiscide. This is a rather personal question, which you are in another obligation to answer. Are you spending more on books than we are paying you on Patreon? That might be a problem. Uh... Let's put it this way. Patron goes a good long way to covering about half of what I probably spend on books. Um, no. Sometimes it does cover the full amount. Some months it's covered the full amount. And some months more books have come out or I found some older books. Because, again, it's collecting things like these. They are lovely, but they can vary in price. Some I've managed to pick up for £20. Some in the collection have been a lot more than £20. And when they come up and they're available, you, they are so rare you can't afford not to get them. So it's collections like that which are the costly things. Um, 
most of the books like this sort of, you know, I've actually, uh, what I love is um, books have started arriving for the next New Ships book review already. I've got Lapanto, which is, they're going to be in the Christmas review, one of them, and the String Bag. And this is sent by Pen and Swords. This was sent to me by the Strategy Bridge. It's really, really cool, but I'll be getting into that in the New Ships one. We'll talk about that then. But so I don't really have to worry about the new books. It's the older books, which are the things which cost me the money. And tracking them down is sometimes very, very expensive and very difficult. <sighs> so final, I never joined a podcast until here. Every other one's so boring. <laughs> well, the motto of bilge pumps is co is context. That is the motto of bilge pumps entirely. It's context, context, context. Right, next book. For its size, surprisingly expensive to and difficult to find. But I have found free uh, all uh, both copies of it online and they're all in as i said in the um the amazon storefront list so you can find them there basically my theory on the storefront list is that in it's so me putting in all the stuff in a place where people can find the books sub-lieutenant by ludovic kennedy Now, this book, of course, has a lovely picture of HMS Tartar in, which was the ship he was serving on at the time, and is published in 1942. This is a reprint, though. It's first published in October 1942. This is the reprint from November 1942. So this book dates from November 1942. You do not want to know how much this cost me to get when I was when I was going. I'm actually quite shocked. The copies on Amazon are actually cheaper than this was when I got it. So that's good. Yeah, these things happen. A fortnight later, I saw my father on board Royal Appendi. I'd never seen him so happy. It was like a child who had been given a new toy. During tea in his cabin, a luxurious room behind the bridge, he kept jumping up to discuss with dockyard officials alterations they were making to the ship's structure. Or one of his officers would come to him with a batch of papers for scrutiny and signature. Afterwards, he took me around the ship. We visited each cabin, each compartment, from the boat deck to the engine room, while he explained the alterations the ship was undergoing, many of which he had himself authorised. We would often stop while he straightened out some problem raised by one of the workmen. His enthusiasm was unbounded, his proud immense his pride immense. I knew then that knew then that the past disappointments which had been rankling for the past eighteen years had vanished. They were forgotten his passionate interest and pride in his new command. Before I left, he showed me the guns lying on the jetty, waiting to be fitted. Big, powerful creatures they looked. Their snouts pointed threatening to the, to the sky. Across the shield of each gun were scribbled in thick white letters, Rawl Pindi. These were the guns about which my father related to a friend. They have given me some guns, good guns, and I'm going to use them. That was the last time that I saw my father, but he used his guns all right. In the middle of October, as a result of interview with the Joint University Recording Board at Oxford, I was commissioned in the Navy as a probationary temporary sub-lieutenant of Royal Naval Volunteer Reserve and appointed HMS King Alfred. My HMS King Alfred is in Brighton. I was billeted in an hotel in 4th Avenue, whose innate inmates were mostly old ladies and retired colonels. I shared a room with a man whose name I cannot remember, but who was the dullest man I've ever met. Fortunately, he complained of my flow of language during the night. I talk and shout in my sleep regularly, and after a few days, left me. Shortly after reporting at King Alfred, I was brought up before the commanding officer, Captain P. Royal Navy. You're Kennedy. 
he said. I knew your father in the last war. I hear he's got the Royal Pindy now. I'm surprised he knew anything about me. We talked for a few moments, and he, then he said, How old are you? 19, sir, I answered. I should be 20 in a fortnight's time. In that case, he said, you'll have to be a midshipman. You were born a fortnight too late. So I was disrated to midshipman and shipped two hideous, uh, and shipped two hideous red tabs on labels on my monkey jacket. Uh, training at King Alfred was of an elementary sort. We were taught the first principles of the conduct of naval warfare. We learned the rules of the road and the laws of navigation. We did gun drill on an ancient weapon and listened to a chief petty officer explain the intricacies of torpedoes and depth charges. We were taught to send and receive messages in Morse and Semaphore in an adjacent park, did field training. 3rd of the 10th, 1939. My dear boy, I have several letters of yours to answer. Some I fear are rather old, but cannot be helped, as I have no time when we are in harbour for perhaps a couple of days, and then we are at sea for several. Mummy will have told you of the two days we had when we spent a night at the cottage. Most comfortable, then lunch with GA fishing with a flick in Glasgow before we were off again. This we hope to repeat. But our future is always uncertain. I'm very pleased to hear how well you shot with Uncle Tom. You mentioned this to me yourself, and I also heard it from Beechwood. What you must learn now is the driven, bir uh, driven bird low and high, although I don't know when you will get any practice of this. Once you get the knack, you'll be all right, but it's quite different to walking up. Your gun seems to fit you, Amroy. Yes, I did shake hands with the king when he visited the fleet, and we had quite a chat. His equerry, Harold Campbell, I know well, and I was glad to meet him and others whom I have not seen for years. It's very amusing meeting some of the bigwigs now who were contemporaries of mine. They are all very jolly and welcoming. Wonderful Admiral, who I have not met before, remarked in conversation, I see you have the China Medal. What ship were you on? To which I replied that I was the sub in Barfleur, when he said he was a midshipman in the en Endymion. While writing the above, the bridge reported that our pet iceberg was again in sight, a formidable ghost-like object. So I thought this a good opportunity to do some more gunnery. We had a very spirited attack on it this afternoon, at long range, and very considerable motion of the ship, which made it difficult but instructive. What I want to know is how long you will remain a midshipman, what work and general training you do. This your next letter will probably tell me, when you are likely to get a sea appointment and what form it is likely to take. Another thing I want to know is the question of your finances. Tell me frankly, have you any debts now, or are you they all paid off? And if they are, pray do not involve yourself in any that you cannot meet. What pay will you get? What, what will you must in cost? And what do they allow you to for uniform? All this I want to know, and then I will see what allowance to give you. Now is the time when we must all live as economy as possible. Income tax has soared up, and I don't know what I shall be doing, if anything, once we have seen this show through. Best of luck, my dear fellow. Pop. Ludovic's father, of course, is, dies with HMS Royal Pindy when she engages against overwhelming odds. Unsurprisingly, for the son of such a man, he was drafted to HMS Tata, a tribal, a tribal class destroyer, as his first role as sub-lieutenant, and takes part in the hunting down of the Bismarck while aboard her. This book is all about his first years of war. It's published during World War II. So it's 1939 to 1942, pretty much. It is a first-hand account of a very junior officer's uh, going through war with the dealing of the fact that his, because his father had been in the First World War and had then lost his post through the Gettys Act, uh, Gettys Acts, and then had managed to get back in post in charge of Royal Pindy and then died. It's a unique example of what was going on in the literature available. So if you haven't already got it, this is good. There are both copies of this book, Sub Lieutenant. There is a po one which is called Sub Lieutenant. And then this was also published as part of a group of free books called Junior Officers. I have both copies. And both copies I found and stuck in the Amazon list. It is very, very good. Come on, Rebuild rooms. Context, context, China. Context, context, China. Yeah. That's why I'm here. Context. People in other rooms argue about this, that, and what else. But what if clocks your insight into history being on a certain point? Yes. Please share how much it costs. Um, there are various different ones costing different... Let me check. There, yeah, the hard... Uh, the making of civil servant costs fifteen pounds. Let me get the list up. I have the list. 
Det, det, det. Let's see, so far... Uh, mm. Sub-Lieutenant is considerably more expensive, but Youth at War is £28, and that's the Fighter Pilot, Sub-Lieutenant and Infantry Officer. That's the collection of three published in 1944, Paul Richley, Ludovic Kennedy, and Anthony Arwen, with a foreword provided by Lord Keyes. That is an absolutely gorgeous book to get. I have you for war. Um, Sub-Lieutenant is £105 on Amazon at the moment. There is, uh, you can find other things. Mainly the reason I put a link that one in is because you'll find it's ISBN and all its other details there. So if you want to hunt it down on various book hunting sites, please do. Go and get it. Don't necessarily buy it from Amazon unless you are very, very rich. And if you are a multimillionaire and able to afford that, please do. You go ahead and uh, get it because it looks like a copy in good condition. I can't even buy the books I need to read. It's, yeah, they're expensive. Gosh, uh, but I cannot actually find them a problem, and I have to go to university libraries. Actually, I have to say, this is one of the reasons I enjoy working for King's University, because I have some very nice librarian buddies. Uh, who are very, very kind to me and very helpful, and uh, who I only bribe with Maltesers on rare occasions. And I just make sure they get Maltesers on those occasions. Big boxes. Tom Sandon, that part of signals training is interesting. That's how they ha know how to signal, but don't understand technology itself. Actually, they get taught the technology as well. So all the officers are taught, as well as there's also all the signalmen and the various other NCOs aboard who know that. Uh, to Kennedy also wrote his book on Nelson and the ships. And uh, one of my favorite ones is he uses his time on HMS Tata to, as the inspiration for this book, The Pursuit, which is also in that list somewhere which is the sinking of the Bismarck. And he is one of the few people who has a first-hand account on this because he's aboard HMS Tartha during it. Junior 101, wasn't Kennedy in documentary about Charles in 1971? Yes, he was. Um, Carl Harman, best bargain you have had. I've had a few books for 20, 20 pounds, one pound. <sighs> one pound. <laughs> Considering the amount of use it's been put to during... My doing the book research for my own book, one pound was amazing. But I get a lot of very good books thanks to a friend down in Tavistock Market. But Ludovic Kennedy was also a liberal MP and he was a really, really popular guy and really a really successful person as well. Uh, he really worked hard for the UK. So, The Battle and the Breeze. Edited by Eric Gove, The Naval Memories of Admiral the Fleet's Edward Ashmore. Now, 
for those of you who've watched the episodes about Taranto, uh, well, no, certain other things, but I'm actually Singtao is what I should be mentioning because I was thinking about Taranto because don't worry. For those of you who watched the episodes about Singtao, now my brain's got over its brain fart, you will not have heard of Ashmore before because he was the sub lieutenant who was sent over to the Vincent de Paul. He goes on to become an admiral of the fleet. And for some reason, he has a very interesting World War II. I can't think why. Um... Back in Scarpa, Middleton and some others, including our chummy ship, another hunt class destroyer, Blankney, received some very welcome orders to go to Gibraltar and reinforce Force H for a special operation. We conducted a practice firing or two as we left, and the fuse keeping clock which controlled our anti aircraft fire became detective. I remember spending most of the passage to Gibraltar sitting in the transmission station with the ordnance officer, the electrical officer, and the drawings, trying to make the thing work again. The operation took place in the middle of June 1942 and was an attempt to relieve the blockade of Malta, which had reached critical proportions. Almost simultaneously, Admiral Vian sailed from Alexandria with some 11 merchant ships and a strong covering force, Operation Vigorous, and Admiral Curtis, who as captain of the fleet in Rodney before the war, we had always known as the Old Toad, sailed from Gibraltar with quite a large covering force, including Middleton, five merchant ships and a tanker, Operation Harpoon. The water was warm, the weather was lovely, good for spotting periscopes, but also ideal for air attack. There came a time when Eagle and our covering force had to turn back and we had to go on alone. By then, the crews of Liverpool had been seriously damaged and we had lost one merchant ship. The air attacks from dawn to dusk by Italian torpedo and high-level bombers and German Heinkels and Ju-88 intensified the nearer we came to Sicily. And then reached the sustained crescendo when the short-range Stukas could reach us. These performed spectacularly, throwing themselves into a high, near-vertical dive straight at their targets, aiming the bomb with the aircraft and pulling out very low. The close escort consisted of five fleet destroyers and four hunt-class destroyers in the, in the charge of the anti-aircraft cruiser Cairo, whose captain, Hardy, had been a physical training officer at Dartmouth. We were thankful that we had embarked as much anti-aircraft ammunition as we could possibly stow before leaving Gibraltar. We passed through the Cape Bond Channel at night, and were at action stations again before dawn. I was scanning the horizon from the director when I sighted to the north what I thought was two battleships and five destroyers. So we made a signal to Cairo, convention in the circumstances, saying, attention is called to such and such bearing. Back came the reply, aircraft inside are friendly. Their uh, with us, uh, there was a fighter with us from Malta. So my captain made an enemy report straight to Armory. This was rebroadcast generally, as was the custom, and father saw it at his breakfast table and sent an anxious, uh, spent an anxious day. Once Hardy appreciated this new threat, he ordered us out in groups. Fleet destroyers hunt and Cairo separately, directly towards the enemy at full speed to close the range, making smoke to screen the convoy, which was left with some minetroopers as close escort. Our best hope, of course, were the torpedoes in the fleet destroyers, and as we closed, they moved ahead of us, having the legs of the hunts. Fire was then opened at extreme range by both sides. Early on, my director Lair, who had a grandstand view of the enemy and whose steady hands were vital to effective fire, had had hiccups which I could hear coming over the intercommunication system, but fortunately, by now, he had calmed down. As we got near, it became apparent that the enemy consisted of two Italian cruisers and five large destroyers. At least there were no battleships. Bedouin and Partridge were hit and stopped, but then, to our great surprise and light, we saw the Italians turn away. The convoy by now was under heavy air attack by Stukas, against which it had precious little defence. As we moved back to support, the enemy turned towards us again, and we checked and turned at them. They show no sign themselves of closing the range, so we joined our convoy, which by then had suffered severely. Kentucky, the tanker, was ablaze and was sunk later by enemy aircraft with another damaged merchantman. Fighter aircraft from Malta eventually joined us, and two surviving merchantmen we made for the island. Yeah. He has uh, a, such an uneventful life, really, Ashmore. You know, he has to, as a sub lieutenant recently commissioned, well, as a midshipman recently commissioned, has to stare down various Japanese gentlemen and uh, trying to get aboard a merchant ship. 
and then, you know, goes on to several convoys in hunt class destroyers, cruisers, and battleships. Um, yeah, and rises to Admiral of the Fleet, so it's a good book. It is a good book. Are there any books, texts on the training scheme of those NTOs and such to be found online? I got the Admiralty Handbook on while I was transferred from 1931. It's 200 pages, including exams, but nothing more modern. I I might have something somewhere. I, message me on Discord, and if I have it, I will send it to you, because I might have something which I got in the National Archives. Uh... Juno199, does he break the record on how many times he's sunk? Actually, he gets through the war without having sunk. That's quite disturbing. Um, yeah, because just posted in books to consider on Discord. Cool. Manly1640, was this where the one tanker made it to Malta with a broken keel? Yes. Husband, a moment signed up for the JU87 rear gunners. Some really brave men who dive on a target screaming while sitting in the craft backwards. Um, I have to say, uh, they're brave, but they're still not quite as brave as the observers in the back seat of the swordfish carrying torpedoes at Toronto who are waist deep in aviation fuel. I'm, I'm sorry, but if I'm sitting waist deep in aviation fuel while firing a machine gun which fires tracer bullets, then, frankly, I think I automatically deserve Victoria Cross just for sitting there. Um, <laughs> it's not exactly where you want to be. Tom Vandal, and your Discord name is Dr. Isaac Clark? I'm, I am just remember what my Discord name is. Um, AC Naval History. That's my Discord name. AC Naval History. Carmen, don't suppose in your travel collection you came across one more in 1946 in Penna Gut Pembroke, Dr. Pembrokeshire. It's later scrap, but the name I forget and I want to see it. I think it was a Santee, but I'm not sure. I would have to check up my list. I have a list of them somewhere. Money in 1640. Waist deep in aviation fuel. Yep. Abgas. Because the long range, extended range fuel tank that was put into torpedo, uh, swordfish torpedo bombers when they were going long range with their sword, uh, with their torpedoes was stuck into the observer's cockpit and the observer would move back into the tail air gunner's cockpit. Uh, telegraphist air gunners topic and um so they will be sitting in there and that cockpit the cockpit was designed in sort of two baths there's the bath which has the pilot that's sort of smaller and then there's the bath at the back which sort of seals it in anyway this tank used to leak and it used to have a centrally draining thing so it would go out the bottom anyway so it didn't really matter if it leaked it would still sort of it would fill up the area but then it would still go into the tank so they wouldn't lose the fuel but the trouble is it it, it what it did was instead of it sitting up in the fuel it found a new equilibrium in the bath that is of the cockpit so the bath the level was well let's put it this way um You can't see it, but if I go about a hand's width down from where my hand is now. So, this way, down. So, everything important would have been a barbecue. I.e., everything below the fuel would have got incinerated, but also their flames would be there enough to go up everywhere. So, basically, you get hit, there's no... There's no coming back from it, okay? There's no coming back from it. Right. 
Calvin Gusman. I remember one string band rear gunner happily, hopefully firing his gun at the Bismarck after torpedo drop. Yes. Dan Freeman. It was to get the range so they had extra fuel tanks and crew space and it leaked. And because any higher and it would spill up the edge. Uh, spill up the edge. Not that quite that high, but yeah, not great. Yeah. The tanks leaked. I <sighs> just no. <laughs> uh now another quiet person's autobiography. Uh, you know, someone who had a nice peaceful war, didn't really do much, you know, the usual. And I'll be carrying this on quite a bit. As I said, I don't have to walk the doggy, so I might well carry this on till 10 o'clock tonight if you guys want to have, still have questions. Manny Chicken 40. That's mildly concerning. Yes, this is again why I think all observers should have been given a Victoria Cross after Taranto. Every single one of them, which was waist deep in fuel, deserved a Victoria Cross. At least a George Cross. At the least a George Cross. <laughs> I, I, I do I, I think the definition of uh, whilst I have uh, seen all the VC winners, I think the def it, it just why did tanks leak so bad? Um because they decided to use a metal tank and it was the seals of the tank. It was actually the seal between the tank and the uh, the where it would go down to feed into the regular tank to fill the engine that was bad. So it was, you know. Yeah. <laughs> right. Hmm. Let's see. What can we do? The 15th Cruiser Squadron consisted of three ships, Naid, which my car's named after, under the command of Captain M. Kelsey, in which my flag was hoisted, Galatea, Captain Sim, and Eurelius, Captain Bush. Dido, Captain H. McCall, was soon to rejoin after major repairs due to bomb damage, and there later followed a new ship, Cleopatra. But the axis of strength was axis of strength was soon nullified by the sinking of Galatea and Naid, and by the transfer of a cruiser squadron, the ninth to Malta. The principal problem facing the commander in chief from November 1941 until the successful issue of the Battle of Lant El Main in October 1942 was to supply um, support Malta to keep it operational whilst denying seaborne supplies to the Africa Corps under Rommel. So long as it was operational, Malta constituted an, effect, an acute threat to General Rommel's lifeline. But when the island was neutralised, the Germans were able to build up supplies faster than their own ink army, and to force us back. Once the soldiers had been pushed back, the Siberian airfields came into a German possession, in addition to those in Crete, Crete and Sicily, which they had held already. Under such circumstances, it became in practice impossible to keep Malta operative, though the attempt had to be made. The situation in November 1941 was unpromising. Unpro the 8th Army had been driven to the Egyptian frontier, although Tobruk was held holding out and must be maintained from seaward at whatever cost. General Kessingring was known to be massively increasing the German air strength in the central Mediterranean, and the odds against Malta were mounting. However, the army was preparing to advance. If it could reach Benghazi and establish the air force in Cyrenia, the relief of Malta from eastwards would become pra a practical proposition. The general course of events during the next six months have been fully described in official histories and narratives, and will not be repeated here, even except insofar as they closely concern this memoir. The operations under my command, which were designed to run supply ships to Malta, were uniformly unsuccessful, except in the short period December 1941 to January 1942, during which time the army was advancing and airfields in Syria were coming into our hands. The operations were all of a pattern, light forces escorting merchantmen along a sea lane over which the enemy possessed command of the air, and into which, if he wished, superior surface forces could be introduced. If and when the surface forces took a hand, the dual-purpose armaments of the Di Frido Dido class cruisers, which remained in the fleet at Alexandria, and of destroyers, constituted a handicap. 
The guns could be fired either at enemy ships or at enemy aircraft, but not at both simultaneously. It was also a disadvantage that the light forces, particularly the small destroyers, carried far too little ammunition to meet the requirements of the prolonged air battle, which the passage to the Malta and the return entailed. The seagoing command of these light forces fell to me in November 1941, when, after a westward sweep carried out by Admiral Rawlings with two cruiser squadrons, the Knight Squadron became based at Malta. The operation had been directed against Italian convoys, one of which, in the event, was found and sunk by the Malta force. The battle squadron, acting in support of these movements, suffered serious loss. Barham was torpedoed by a U-boat and sunk with heavy loss of life, Men train battleships were thus reduced to two. Queen Elizabeth of Valiant, both dating from the First World War, the Italians had four available, two of which were large and modern. On the 18th of the 8th of December, in intending to intercept the supplies being run by the enemy in torpedo boats from Narvin to Dema, the commander-in-chief sailed the, that well-known destroyer officer, Captain Philip Mack, in Jervis, with two ships of the 22nd Flotilla, the patrol of the support. I sailed in Naid with the destroyers Griffin and Hotspur to act in support. The patrol found nothing, but the destroyers were attacked by torpedo bombs, and Jackal, one of Mack's ships, was hit. The cruisers then moved in. They were ordered to take over patrol the following night, and so, and to sight Derna the next morning in case there should be ships unloading in the port. It seemed to me that as Naid was so much larger than any ship which could be berthed in Derna, our sighting the port to achieve the object given could only result in being ourselves sighted, which would, of course, be a bring reaction from enemy aircraft operating from airfields in area and from the shore about batteries. Following the line of thought, why be bombed without go having a go first, orders were given to bombard during the approach, preference being given to ship as uh, shipping as targets. Admiral Vian. Following the line of thought, why be bombed without having a go first? Orders were given to bombard during the approach, the preference being given to shipping at targets. Another officer might have gone, why not use a destroyer? It's more sensible. Vian goes, well, if I'm going to be spotted, I might as well be spotted doing something they'd rather I wasn't doing. So I'll bombard them. There's, you know, this is the thing. Vian is his book is entitled "Action This Day." He basically goes looking for action every day, and not of the kind which men, you know, we norm. It just he's basically how do I put it politely? These two, Carlton de Weir and Vian, very very similar as far as they're concerned. Ooh. War. No. Neither of them likes to lose people, but they do like to do the operations. As Drac reminded in the last World of War streams, they did they sent the Light Brigade only once, yes. There was a plan to send a second night thing. There was also a plan at one point for the battleships to get close and bombard after the air attack, and there was it would have been a, a far larger affair if the second aircraft carrier had been available. New IKB 4472, so could it have been fixed with duct tape? Not really. Because, actually, I think the fuel would have eaten through the duct tape. Carl uh, yes, Dr. Clark, would you like me to remind you to check which travels more post-World War II in Pen and Gut, if so, so uh, what day I'll give you uh, that. Um, if you send me a message, I'll look it up and I'll post it in a um, in a community chat on uh, on the YouTube. Do you know one He brings the stuff that is overkill for a simple situation. Well, you know, he's being... It's kind of like when he's told to watch Bismarck all night. We all know he's not going to watch Bismarck all night. He's going to attack. He's being told to go and check to see if there's ships there. Well, if he goes and checks if there's a ship there, then they'll just send someone else to take out the ship if there is the ship there. But if he goes in shooting, then if there's a ship there, there won't be a ship there. So he'll save both bombers, and he'll justify himself being there. Many of these 16 before, If I recall, that tank with the broken keel reaching mortal was crucial in ability to maintain flying the aircraft base. Yes, it was. It was critical.
Sean Mack, Admiral Mitchell in the corner tearing his hair out. Uh, that was Admiral Mitchell. That was many American admirals' response when they met Vian. Usually it was to tearing their hair out, then it was going, what are you planning on doing next? There is an argument that actually, if you'd wanted to, and this was a joke put forward once by one of my professors, and I always remember it, that the options were the Americans dropping a dropping the nuclear bombs on Japan or letting, Ad, uh, letting Admiral V and getting some ships close to their shore. Either one would probably have done the job. But I think that was a bit of an overstatement. But there again, the more I've read and the more I studied Vian over the years, the more I've started to think that actually Dr. Michael Partridge might have been onto something. Uh, do you know why, not? why bring a DD when you have 50? Uh, he's got 5.25 inch guns. Uh, they were a Dido class cruiser. <laughs> hmm. Jeff Hillen. Weird segue. Overlord in 1943 would have been commanded by Plain Cook Anderson, commander of the First Army North Africa. What do you think of his chances? I can wargame this. Uh... If you're doing Overlord in 1943, it's a lot more complicated. The Germans haven't been worn down near as much. Right then. So, next book. <laughs> oh, God. And so to battle by Basil Jones. I can't find this on Amazon, so you'll have to you can you'll have to hunt it down, I'm afraid. But if you want it. Admiral Power offered me a job on his staff. Perhaps I was stupid not to accept it, but I felt within myself that after so long enjoying the flesh pots of Bombay, albeit not of my own accord, I must be active and justify my existence as a trained fighting man. This may sound rather pretentious, but although one could and did admire the brains who planned and organized the war gaming and waging of war, the plain wish to prove oneself in combat was paramount. Perhaps it was due to influence of rugby football. It was the same feeling exactly as when one went on the field before a big game. I went to the Vice Admiral Malta and explained my wishes. He seemed a bit surprised, and when I told him I would like to go back to my old command, HMS Isis, to whom I had been appointed during a refit in Bombay, he said, but do you want to go to uh, go straight into operations just after being sunk? I answered, yes. And so in a few days, I found myself back on in my Isis. At this time, it was decided that apart from the effect of the reduction in the destroyers at Malta caused by the loss of Pakenham, it was desirable that the force available in Malta should be increased. This was achieved by the arrival of destroyer leader Jervis and other destroyers from Alexandria. Jervis had a captain in command and took over the ships of the 12th Flotilla to make one force. Apart from a rather diverting, if moradious, uh, dinner party, which seemed more like a board of inquiry than a social occasion, we saw little of him, uh, since operations tended to involve only one or two, uh, only two or three destroyers at a time. Operations on the Pantelero run uh, continued on one occasion, including a cruiser. This period was one of intense activity by our submarines, MTBs, and destroyers, and many notable inceptions of enemy ships endeavouring to supply their now retreating armies took place. The outstanding destroyer in this work was undoubtedly HMS Nubian, Commander Holland Martin, who had carried out some 20 sorties against the enemy since the beginning of the war, with many brilliant successes. Our Captain Dean Jervis, with the Greek destroyer Princess Olga, also had a highly successful action against two Italian destroyers. In this latter connection, I hoped that Admiral Holland's remark that I had entirely reorganized gunnery instruction in the Greek Navy came to fruition. Meanwhile, the victories in North Africa continued, and I found myself on patrol off Cape Bon, when the big question was whether or not Rommel would try to organize a Dunkirk evacuation of his armies. 
As the German Italian air became weaker and more involved with our own now operating in the strength from North Africa, so the control of the central Mediterranean became ours again, and enemy shipping movements impractical. With some pleasure, my ISIS bombarded Pantelera and patrolled around that area. On one occasion, we landed a small party on a small island near Cape Bow to conduct a search, which yielded a one very young and skinny German soldier who had carried out a small evacuation all by himself. He was immediately adopted by the ship's company, who fed him up and washed his clothes, and finally made him look more worthy of all the effort and armament expended on his capture. Some reorganization now took place, and ISIS came under control of the NOIC, Naval Officer in Command, appointed to the newly won Algerian port of Bezetta. Great events were now pending, namely the invasion of Sicily, aimed for July 1943, and more and more convoys and warships had to be escorted from Gibraltar to the scene of action. For this time, enemy action at sea was practically nil, except regards SMs, submarines. It was felt that German submarines would now enter and endeavour to enter the Mediterranean via the Straits of Gibraltar, but their presence was not yet apparent. The many suspected and actual minefields laid by the Italians in the central Mediterranean were a menace, tending to restrict movement, and it was not until the magnificent work done by the third minesweeping flotilla between 9th May and 9th June 1943 was completed that movement was comparatively free. Events moved rapidly, and on 10th of July, the first landing by American troops, our and American troops, was made on Sicily. Just two months later, the Italian fleet surrendered. ISIS was at anchor in Bezerta Bay when Admiral Cunningham, in a hunt class destroyer, emerged from Bezerta Harbour and proceeded to the mouth of the bay as the Italian battleship steamed past on her way to internment in Malta. It was a great moment, and I would li uh, have liked to have accompanied the CNC out to sea. However, on his return to harbour, the CNC sent me a signal from his HQ ship in Bezerta Lake at the head of the canal, joining it to the harbour, saying, Captain, repair on board. The form of the signal seemed to suggest something amiss. I put on my best uniform and endeavoured to comply with his wishes. As usual, our motorboat was under repair, so I was pulled ashore by our whaler to the NOC's wharf, where I asked if they had a powerboat which could take me up to the Bezerta Canal. By great good fortune, they were able to provide me with an old naval launch, which putted up the canal in due course, depositing me at the CNC's uh, HQ ship gangway. It has been a great day for the CNC, and I would not have been as surprised if he'd been surrounded by empty bottles of champagne in an infestive mood. I entered the cabin. He once fixed me with his rather frightening rolling eye, which I remembered from a previous encounter. He said sternly, I've seen you somewhere before. I replied, yes, sir, at the gunnery school at Whale Island. He said, that's a bloody awful place to meet anyone. I was a bit uh, non-pulsed, but perhaps unfortunately replied, yes, sir, I lectured to you at the senior officer's technical course on night action. It could be argued that it was not the best conversational gambit on which to address the victor of the night action of Cape Mountain. I certainly received what could be only described as a rather minatory look. Chief of Staff said the CNC to Commodore Dick, who was sharing the Nazem. Take this officer down below and tell him what I want him to do. I retired with Dick, a little bit weird, but as soon as I got down to the business, and I found that I was allotted to receive the surrender of all Italian submarines and conduct them to Malta. It was not a difficult job, but as it included a night passage, the only danger was to ensure that the surrounding submarines were not attacked by passing ships and convoys now constantly joining in from the west. A conference with the Italian ECOC commanding officers was arranged at Bone, and I had the unusual opportunity of being chairman of a committee, the other members of which were all Italian. They all seemed to speak good English and were not only cooperative but quite charming. So it was at dusk that we set off, ISIS leading in line ahead with the surrendering submarines on the surface. If attacked, they had orders to dive and stay put, but I explained the situation while I explained the situation to any attacker, and had signaled to submerge submarines with small charges when they might surface again. However, all went well, and I duly delivered my parcels to the Vice Admiral Malta. Shortly after this, I was de it was decided that ISIS should be based at Gibraltar. In war, Gibraltar was a delightful place to be stationed. As it as a base, it was almost completely out of enemy aircraft range, but from it one could emerge onto activity in both in the Mediterranean and into the Atlantic. It was a shore base captain destroyers, and as the senior commander of float, I again found myself in command of a flotilla, the 13th. The Vice Admiral Gibraltar was Admiral Burrow, who had briefly been my captain in Whale Island after Captain Parra left. He's a very exceptional man, and in what he exercised command with great firmness, efficiency, and good humour, without any outward mannerism of taking charge. In general, our job consisted in receiving the many convoys and warships entering the Mediterranean and screening them eastwards in the Southern area. This is a very good book if you can find a good co a, a copy of it. I know some of you have managed to find a copy after I've been talking about it, but, you know, it is good. <laughs> 
Dan Hurin, sea salamander. I was told I couldn't have a polar class cruiser. No other way. No one here to say I couldn't have a Bismarck class on their boarding bodies. Oh, God. They would have done. <laughs> Jeff Beeler, who else has read the uh, new Osprey books? One on. Uh, uh, one on the Great Flight, uh, Great White Fleet, and the globalization of the USN, and the one on the Dutch Navy from 1929-45, and its focus on suborations. They're both they're good books. Jeff Beeler, probably why Vian was moved to aircraft carriers. I'm yeah, and he did well there. Hi, Derp Squad. No, you haven't missed the end. We're going on till about 10 o'clock. you got plenty of time. I've got one more book to do, and then I'll do question and answers till 10 o'clock. But very, very good book, if you can get a copy. I think I was told there's about 500 to 1,000 of these published in total. So not a lot, but very, very good book. Excuse me a second. Before I do the last book. Right. Last book. Rather appropriate considering we've been kept talking about him. <sighs> the last book is Cunningham. A Sailor's Odyssey, the autobiography of Admiral of the Fleet, Viscount Cunningham of Hindhope. Tuesday, July the 2nd, was a day of tense activity and anxiety. It had to be spent in acquainting all the British flag officers and captains with what was afoot, and also making preparations for attempting to seize the French ships if the home government insisted on it. I also invited the vi French Vice Admiral to visit me at 7am next morning, an unusual hour which must have caused him to realise that something momentous was about to happen. Vice Admiral Godfrey arrived punctually, accompanied by his chief of staff, and was piped over the side with our Royal Marine Guard and band paraded. I received him with the usual officers in attendance, accompanied by my chief of staff, Rear Admiral Algernon, Algernon Willis, and the Commander R.M. Dick. We went below. The meeting took place in my after cabin in Warspite, with all of us sitting in armchairs instead of around the table. The proceedings were entirely formal. We spoke English, except in so far that Commander Dick interpreted if there was any likelihood of misunderstanding. Vice Admiral God, uh, Godfrey's demeanour was entirely helpful and cordial, though we could realise and see the strain on which he was labouring. A message from the British government was read to the Admiral, and he was given a copy. It expressed the desire that ships would fight on with us. He seemed to accept the force of the argument and made no comment, except to say that he would have preferred to have this from his own government. 
I'd explained in my instructed by the British government to lay before him various proposals for disposal of French squadron, and that I must ask him to accept one or other that day. The first proposal was the British government asked you to put their, at their disposition the naval units under your command so that you can they can continue to struggle against the enemy side by side with the Royal Rich Navy. For those who wish to join us, uh, the conditions of service and pay will be the same as that of officers, petty officers, and men of corresponding rank in the British Navy. Those who not wish to fight, continue to fight, uh, continue to fight, are entirely free to return to France, and changes will be made as soon as practical for them to do so. You are asked to announce these proposals in such a way that they are known to all the officers and ships' companies, and to make it clear that they are free to make their choice without any constraint. The British government guarantees to return to France at the end of war all ships which have thus taken part with us in the struggle against the enemy. Admiral Godfrey raised many objections to this alternative, and he said he could not possibly accept it without consulting his government. How, he asked, could their ships fight, again, except, fight, uh, ships fight except under the French flag? The officers and men would be deserters. Furthermore, if he used any of his ships for the war, he felt sure the Germans and Italians would demand an equivalent number of ships on the same class to be handed over to them. At this point, I pointed at this point stage. I pointed out to Godfrey, terms were good, and that if I could, if I wished, communicate them to the French squadron over his head, but naturally preferred not to take the step. Godfrey admitted that he was fully aware of this. During further discussion, I frequently impressed on Godfrey that surely his object was not only to prevent his ships from falling in the hands of the enemy, but also to preserve them for France. This evidently had a strong effect. However, there seemed to be no prospect of his accepting the conditions outlined. We passed on to the second proposal. If you remain convinced that it is not possible to allow your forces to help the British Navy, the British government asks you to put your ships in a condition in which they cannot go to sea and leave on board only skeleton crews sufficient to keep the ships in good order. In this case, the British government guarantees the pay and supplies to the officers and men thus left on board and that the ships will only be used if the enemy breaks the terms of the armistice concluded between Britain, France, Germany and Italy. Godfrey brightened up considerably when he read this and at once admitted, uh, uh, imitated that he thought he could accept it. He expressed a desire to have a little time to think about it, and when offered until, say, 1pm, said, Oh, soon that. The hour of 11.30am was agreed to. The Vice Admiral then showed a third proposal. If these proposals are neither of them acceptable, the British government asks you, uh, asks you as a third alternative to order your forces in Alexandra to see in order to sink them outside the port in deep waters. This evoked no enthusiasm, and when I pointed out that, that it would in no way sense achieve his main objective of preserving ships for France, he agreed to revert to the consideration of the second proposal. He demurred somewhat at the idea of the crews being removed from his ships. In the back of his mind, Evanley had strong hopes that the Italians would break the armistice and that he would be able to get into fight again. I concluded the meeting, which ended at 8.30am, by impressing on Godfrey that he must make up his mind by himself and by the end of the morning. I also intimated that, uh, with all the tact I could muster, that it was a case of force majeure and that he could honourably accept either one or the other of the three uh, proposals. I added my personal hope that if he could not be the first, it would be the second. Godfrey and his chief staff then returned to the French flagship, the 10,000 ton cruiser Dunagesque. Uh, as a result of this interview, we felt distinctly optimistic, and I signaled to the Admiralty saying that negotiations so far indicated that Vice Admiral Godfrey was likely to accept the second proposal, that of putting his ships in condition in which they could not go to sea. I expect his definite answer at noon. It's a good book. It is a very good book. Carl Harman, the US let Britain deal with Japan however they always see fit. Who do you choose, Admiral and, sh uh, and shipwise? Uh, the US make their ships and crews available as well as any ship. Ah, uh, you gotta send Vian. Um, I would love Cunningham to have been out there, but he by this point he was back as uh, fleet, his fleet commander. Ramsey's probably the best you've got, but as uh, uh, Ra Ramsey's sort of wandering around, but <sighs> Fraser, Fraser is good for the strategic command, and frankly, he's the best of the options available, especially as he leaves it pretty much to Vian to do the job. And the other officers are all Cunningham's hand-picked men. So they're fairly... It's a fairly good command. The British Pacific Fleet is a very good force in terms of British Admiralty and the officers they have there. Um, ships, 
I'd love more of them, but it's what's available. If I could have any ships I wanted, I would have the entire carrier force and the entire battle fleet, of course, though, just to go bang, 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 basically. Cosferanus, anyone have books for, uh, bo and have book recommendations for naval amphibious operations in the months following the end of World War II? Especially in the Pacific. Uh, not really. Calm guys, Repolo class. Polo was major KUK Kriegsmarine naval base in World War I. Ajax the East Coast. I, uh, yeah. There are a couple of uh, amphibious books in that, in that one. But if you're going for amphibious operations at the end of World War II, probably the one edited by um, Tristan Lovering, which you'll find somewhere in there, will be uh, is, is one. Hmm. Duskins is pronounced Dukin, I think. Mm, possibly. Uh, I, I, Jeff Yellow, Vice, uh, uh, Vian Philip, Admiral X. <laughs> ah. Action this day. Ah, the French version. What was the decision of the French uh, set officer? Eventually, he hands over ships. He then he hears about Merzel Kibir. That makes him slightly annoyed, but he realizes quite how many warships are on him. So he goes with option two. That was Alexandria. Merzel Kibir was uh, where Somerville was in charge. So basically, there was a joint French. There were joint French forces around with the British in many, many bases, not just in the UK, but in all sorts of other places. Well, the French was organized. Merzel Kabir was um, Merzel Kabir is not a good scenario. I think we are now in the Q and A portion, and as I said, I will keep on to ten o'clock. But while I'm doing this, I will remember to say, as always, thank you to all the people who watch the videos. Thank you to all the people who like the videos. Thank you to all the people who have subscribed. Thank you to all the people who pressed the little bell down there. Thank you to all the people who joined Discord. Thank you to all the people who are who do super chats. Thank you to all the people who do Patreon, because you all of you make it possible and worthwhile to keep doing this. Some of you are the ones who make it financially possible. Some of you are the ones who make it emotionally possible in a way, you know, because it's nice getting the feedback. So thank you to everyone. All right. Now to the Q&A. And as we all know, the patron, the patron money goes on books. The super chat goes on iron brew and occasionally takeaways when I'm really hungry. <laughs> I should so stop having so many takeaways. I had about, I had ended up having two last week. It's really not good for me. <laughs> hmm. Come on, Doctor. Um, how about take the free navies if they want to play with the Japan, USN, and uh, French, and, and just set off Japan with most Allied navy ships, no matter how clapped out as a message of this is only ending one way. Well, that's always an interesting one, but that's requiring on people telling the Jap the Japanese people actually realizing there's the fleet is out there. Thomas Van der uh, yep, thanks to one very smart and arrogant flotilla commander, they, they had that, or am I confusing events now? Um, they had, a, there were all sorts of issues going on in Mesut Kabir, and all sorts of issues going on in Alexandria, which made them, made them turn around that. Trousers, anyone want to write what the doctor said in response? I did not catch that properly. Hmm. Garmin, uh, take away Iron Brew. It should help the food comes of Iron Brew. Um, it always should, though. But no, I have to say, usually I, the Iron Brew supply my own stocks. Today I've been sort of naughty. I kind of missed lunch, so I'm kind of living off Iron Brew today.
Right, so let me just sort of play with this a little to make that a bit better. Right then, um, could Mezzo Kabir have been reasonably avoided, or would the French fleet joining in the British or moving to Cabrini have led to the Germans annexing Vichy France? Actually, move, the French fleet moving to Vichy France, uh, to the Caribbean, would not have led to the annexing, annexing Vichy France. In fact, moving to the Caribbean was one of the options which the French had considered for their fleet. So, as Drax says, if the Admiral had been one of two officers, either one prepared to exercise authority on his own and take decision, or actually had been the type of officer who actually does send full and frank and full information back to the higher command so they know what the options are, it could have been sorted out. But because he decided to be an indecisive officer who also wouldn't communicate properly with anyone, Merzak Kabir happened. And Somerville was too nice. He should have basically bashed in the frickin' hell. Kahaman, I don't even see the Japanese leadership fighting if we had the soldiers to invade relatively close. I, I think that's a lovely idea. But honestly, the Japanese leadership was... Even after the nuclear bombs were still suspect and kind of interesting and almost had some issues. So, yeah. You have to remember the, the army leadership especially, but also to an extent some parts of the Navy, were of Japan were very, very interesting personalities. Two medium Steph Thompson, you 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 say you split two medium pizzas with your with your mum. That sounds like a, a very kind son thing to do. Uh Jacob Werner, hello. We sink Japan. That's always a problem. Carl Harmon. Uh, hmm. I would agree, Juno 191. I would agree that. Replace the long lance with Mark 14 torps. That would be cruel and unusual punishment to anyone. That would be. Replay, uh, replace the long lance from Mark 14s, and that's just cruel and unusual punishment. Seriously, I wouldn't even give the Mark 14s to the Germans, and, I'm, and I, I really don't want them to win World War II, but I just think that's cruel and unusual punishment. Decision. It's okay to call them religious something. Uh, uh, the Japanese do. Yes, I know, but I try and be sort of um, more definitive on who I use that phraseology for. Shumak, the lack of proper communication is excusable. You are in port and you have all the communications infrastructure you can need. There is no reason why you shouldn't tell them everything. Yep, I agree. Come, that's true. Well, the Emperor, at least if you ha have that many ships and if we have just the south planes that are like guns and bombard. Mm. Nick, 16 to 40. So wait, an admiral who is unwilling to make command decisions and also unwilling to pass along information to the superiors. Why was this person in charge again? Honestly, Melanie, I have no idea, but that's the French Navy who's in charge down at Merzog Kibir. Um, if you ever want to set Drac off on a very interesting and fulsome rant, uh, if you go through bilge pumps, we actually let him do it. It's like one of the things in bilge pumps is it's it's a it's a therapeutic space in that we are allowed to do our rants. And I will not edit them out. I will let them go through to the public. And, uh, yeah. Him on Merz al-Kabir. I think it was about a 15-minute um, soliloquy. With me and Jamie just sitting there listening and going, You have studied this in intense detail, my friend. You should write the book.
JP, look, how did anti-piracy operations in the Far East in the 1930s and, and 1930s and 1920s and 30s affect the development of the fleet air arm? Um, not really as much as you would think. It did have an impact on their concept of operations. It had more of an impact on their idea of how they were going to maintain aircraft operating. Because when you're dealing with piracy, it's presence, and it's a maximizing presence. So actually, a big alpha strike doesn't really help that much, because you often don't need that much firepower. But keeping continuity of operations going, and it's when they start to think about the continuity of operations, and it then filters into the exercises, which have a bigger impact. So... It is sort of the place which starts the ball rolling, but it doesn't have the big impact itself. It becomes a landslide thanks to the operation, uh, thanks to the exercises. So, stand about if. That's good. The Japanese leadership didn't care about civilian generally. Nukes didn't encourage them to surrender, but that they wanted to hold up onto as much of Manchuria as possible. Hmm. Why do Eagle and the Hermes retain their heavy secondary guns until loss? Because mostly they were deployed on either presence missions or anti-surface radar missions, and the fear was always that they might be caught by a surface radar. Because on surface radar missions, especially counter-surface radar patrols, they were often split off from the cruisers they were working with by quite a considerable distance because it was a big search area. So there was always a chance that the surface radar would manage to get close to one of them. Don't find out, if we'd anticipated the same level of mobilization and fighting inside Japan after landing, as was the case with Germany, we could expect the specific war to have been at least two times more deadly. Frankly, they were looking at the various experiences of fighting on Japanese islands and Okinawa, etc., and not looking forward to the casualty list in any way, shape, or form. Dan Freeman, Clark, which people who we do not have thoughts, autobiography, do you think would be interesting illuminating? Any I'm thinking Nelson, Captain of Grass Bay, Admiral of Bilbao, anything else? <sighs> there is a massive list. There are... You see, everyone would like Nelson. I'd like Collingwood. I would like Collingwood's autobiography because he was contemporary of Nelson, but also the one who did so much more and dealt with the things after Trafalgar. I would also like Ramsey. I'd love his autobiography because he was an interesting officer. Henderson, of course. You're setting me up for that one for the bingo. Um... Sherbrooke, the former tribal cap uh, tribal destroyer commander who got a VC. His autobiography would be cool. It would be very, very cool to have. Lucas Janish, hello. I haven't seen you before, so hello, Lucas. Uh, had the British plans for invasion of Japanese homelands? Yep. They'd had them since about 19... <sighs> probably since about ni and then in about 1920s. They'd been sort of working in 1926, probably. Uh, their, war for, their war plan for Far East versus Japan was always far more about blockade than actual amphibious or so actual invasion. But they had them as the backup because they didn't want the war to go on forever. And they had them in going into World War. They were part of the planning process. Because as much as Various officers would like to keep it an American-only affair. The projected losses were so great that they couldn't. It was going to be an American, Canadian, British, Indian, Australian, New Zealand, everyone affair. I think even the free, even the French were planning on sending some troops. Um, Thomas Vanderbilt, 57 of German casualties were suffered in the last one months of war in Europe. Extrapolate that to German. Yeah.
Kind of dragging on the okay. here. Kind of like watching a good doctor talk about Creek. <clears throat> or Singapore. Both of them. Come on. You've got a freaking island to defend. Just control the water. Uh, uh, control the freaking water supplies. And actually set up some half decent logistics. I don't know. Plow up some fields. Either way. You can be happy. Make a road. So all your supplies do not have to come round to the enemy facing side of the island. Do that in while it's peacetime. Before the enemy actually attack you. That could be a good idea. Sorry, I'm going to stop now. That Crete will leave that. Nimitz. Yes, sure, Mac. That would be very good. Do you know one why not? So get Drak and you going by bringing up um, as could be in the sinking of, of Prince of Wales and Repulse. Got it. Oh yeah, four C. Oh, good lord. That actually gets the whole of Bill Trump's going four C. Thunder Kahneman, the British politician Philip Nell Baker said the Allies would have lost the war without the Norwegian merchant fleet. However, well, or does it contain some truth? Okay, he's a politician, so it's a little bit of a hyperbole, but actually, honestly, they were critical to bridging the gap until the Liberty and Victoria ships could start delivering. So it was it would have been a lot tighter, a lot closer run thing without them. Frankly, Germany's invasion of Norway really helped in World War II. It would have been better if they'd invaded Norway and then we'd kicked them out of Norway so they hadn't got Norway and we'd still got the Norway Norwegian merchant ships doing the convoy routes because that would have been spectacular. But no. Second best turnout was us getting the Norwegian merchant fleet. Greetings, Dennis Nichols. Hello. I don't think I've seen you before, so hello. Mm -hmm. Gar Harman, how can we trigger armored carriers? How can you trigger Jamie? There are so many ways. <laughs> Just start saying things like the armored carriers were built with only Mediterranean and Mediterranean in mind and just watch them. Uh, mail link 16040. Where is this rant on Mail Sir Kabir? It's in one of the Bilge Pumps episodes. So, in the Simple Cast podcast, uh, in sort of the podcast we do for Bilge Pumps. I forget which one it is, and it isn't, it? It'll be labeled. Uh, the car was re big alpha strike in the decisive nace of battle. It is a good thing. Sadly, it frequently turns into attrition warfare, leapfrog, whatever. Yeah, the trouble is there is the alpha strike is a lovely thing if you're going to have the big battle. For example, the British would have loved to have managed to. They did launch their version of an alpha strike with one carrier at Matapan, but imagine if they'd had two or three carriers and arranged the U.S. style for Matapan. That would have been a huge strike. But the thing is. Those, would those carriers have been able to launch that huge strike after having provided air defense all day for the fleet and air defense all the next day for the fleet? That's what the British carriers were oriented around, fighting the whole day, fighting a battle which doesn't stop and start, which just keeps going. Sure, Matt, because we have some of his notes, but um, 
his notes to his wife, but Nimitz wanted to let history decide and actually it, uh, didn't want a, a biography written about him until after he died. Sensible man. Gus Ramsey, I think there was something written by Ramsey. I don't recall what it was, though. I, I, I think I saw it in Hulsworth Library. Uh, there is a small bit, but it's not much. It's not really a proper autobiography. It's not his full life. Juno 101, is a 20-inch naval gun even possible? It's, it's possible, but, you know, it's going to be expensive and it's going to be big and heavy. Carmen, that would be useful and could be justified as improving infrastructure for locals. Yes. Dunra Karma, crosses off plow the airfields from the... Uh, from the uh, <laughs> bingo. Glad. Thomas Vanderbilt, Dr. Vanderbilt, did not mention the, not to mention the Soviets got involved from 9th August 2. They landed on some islands, or did I get it or something, at Singapore, fantastic commander, yeah, cough, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, Here, there is all sorts of issues. We won't get into Singapore, and we won't get into, the, the Russians were invading Manchuria first, but I think they were aiming for some islands, but they didn't have much of an amphibious capability in the Pacific at the time. Unless the Allies choose to split. Shamak, also, if you hold Malaya, you can build that railroad from Burma into China, which means that Matterhorn could be the start of a major allied operation in China, rather than a political statement. Yep. Dennis Nichols, while shopping for Boyd's RN Easter Waters, I came across The Great Betrayal, Britain, Australia, and the Onset of the Pacific War by David Day. I thought a good compare-contrast study with these. Me, yes, but it's also a bit... Mm. Quite a lot of the books about The Great Betrayal forget that Britain's... All... The thing is, Britain's already set up and all set up to fight the war in the Far East. Because it expects the war in the Far East to come before the war in Europe. And then the war in the, Europe happens for the first. And it happens in completely the wrong order for the British. Because it goes Germany, Italy, Japan. And they're expecting to go Japan, Italy, then Germany. Because Germany's experienced in World War I. Surely that's going to make them less likely to start a war with Britain. They know we can seal them off. So you have all the equipment inexorably moved this way. And then suddenly Japan happens. And there's only so much equipment to go around. You can't build that much. And honestly enough, none of the Dominions or Britain had been building enough in the 1920s. And in the 1930s, the Britain was slow to start with the building program, but the Dominions were even slower. Jay Vida, what has been written about a mid-60s Indonesian confrontation? Not enough. There's some good stuff, though. Mm-hmm. Juno101, any chance there can be a dedicated build from YouTube channel? At the moment, no, but we might work on that one eventually. It depends. If we decide... At the moment, we're just doing a few sort of starter videos just to see what they're like and if people like them. They're going to be shared between mine and Drax's channel, so we're going to have them divide. It's going to be divided in multiple parts, and it's going to be shared up between the two channels just to see if people like them, and then we will go from there. And if people do like them, we'll carry on with more. Carmel Gasman, besides, if the RN had had free carriers of Matapan, would the RM sail out? Probably they still would have, because they still had a land base there to protect them. Many King's Rook, many, I suspect it's Bilge Pumps uh, 08, uh, number 8. Narco subs, Melzo could be a naval icebreakers. Yep, that sounds like the right one. It got bit equal billing because we let him, he was enjoying himself so much on it. It's a good, it's a good podcast.
Carl Harmon, uh, Dr. Clark, I'd also consider building a few railways all on the ground, purely by coincidence. In Crete? Yes, I'd love to, if I had the infrastructure ability to do it. In time. I would have, if I'd had the support and ability to build it, I would have done it. But, you know, that's going to take a lot longer than building a road. And be a lot more, once it's done, it'll be great, but getting it done is going to take longer. Uh, Bud guy 8829 what do you think of the USN, uh, USN not going after a sixth generation air fighter like the Air Force because of the problems the F-35 pro program? I think that you will find the talk we're going to be having with Steve George later in the year, the second talk with him, because he fulfilled Bilge Pumps so much talking about his ex experience as an air engineering officer, and we've got more stories of that to come, I swear, to, to get out of him. Um, we will be going into the F-35 project and his involvement in that, and really some of the stuff he can all about. Jamie is the biggest F-35 skeptic going in so many respects. But after chatting with Steve George, Jamie's going, that makes sense, why don't they talk about this? And Steve is just explaining the stuff going through, and it's you find all the stuff has been put out, but it's all been put out in such a the F-35 is a classic program which is absolutely terribly managed from a PR perspective. They concentrate on doing the razzmatazzy bits but not providing the content. Hmm. New IKB-4472. What size of force could the British have supported in China if they hold Malaya and build their supply railway from Burma to China? Well, you know the 14th Army. That would have probably been in China. Definitely. The RCN goes from two destroyers of some trawlers in 1930 to the third largest Navy in the world, 1945. Yes. It's the, that's the reality of what happens. Sure, Mac. Was there any reason the guns in Singapore didn't have a lot of AGE rounds outside of it was cheaper to not buy them than to stockpile them? Uh, you've got it there in one. They have guns. They're producing armor-piercing rounds for the battleships, and the main attack is supposed to come by sea, so someone decides we're going to save money. But seriously, having some decent dual-purpose guns would have probably made it give you enough AGE. If you had put some Four and a half inch, or five point two fives, or nine point twos, or any of the coastal battery guns we had available elsewhere, and put some there with some blooming HE, which we did have. You could have dealt with it. Also, putting some troops on the reservoir. Okay, I know I I hate people when they normally do this. Because I don't like second guessing commanding officers in hindsight. In hindsight, is always twenty twenty. But I would have thought an obvious one would be: we've built defences around this reservoir. That's our main water supply. We'll put some troops there. I know you don't have many troops to go around. I know there aren't a lot of. It's not infinite forces. You don't have inf everything infinitely available. But still, some troops on the reservoir. <sighs> Carmen, about the only thing I admired in mean is is uh, the UC two pounder, basically universal carrier with two pounder uh, strapped uh, uh, strapped to top. Plenty punch enough to take care of Japanese tanks made by uh, made by Australia. Yeah, that is a fairly good system. Sam Thompson. Hello, Samuel. According to the sources, PBY from Midway spots Japanese invasion task force about 0900 hours on the June 3rd. The B-17 reaches that task force about 1530. Why did Yamamoto and Nagumo expect to surprise Midway? They just do. It, 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 they have no other options to roll the dice. They are trying to roll the dice for a meeting engagement. They are trying to roll the dice to give themselves some security. 
if they go on the defensive, then that just allows the Americans to build up. Their only option is to go on the offensive. So their only job is to try, and that's what they're trying with Midway. They are just trying. They're just trying something. Lucas Jantz, could the other guns like the 18-inch uh, Mark 71 come back to use as placing orders for rail guns? Theoretically. Upgraded versions. So probably it'd be the 8-inch Mark 82 or something. Sometimes an IJN did not just uh, just force concentrating or, or concentration or the plan at all between 0930 June 3 3rd and US dive on arrival at 1025 uh, 1021 June. Why no adjustments by the IJN? Again, they thought they were safe. They didn't realize that the US Navy was around. They thought they had strategic surprise. Okay? That's the thing. They think they have strategic surprise. They think they can surprise the Americans, that the Americans might find them from Midway. That's fine, though. There's going to be hardly any forces around Midway. Shomak, the ratio of negative information to positive information for the F-205 that it has started generating additional, uh, that it has started generating additional negative information. Yep. Melee 640, what are we talking about here? It's basically a Q&A going on, and I've got currently three threads of conversation being asked to me, including ones about Midway. Juno 199, 4C would have been useful for Singapore. That's why in my Singapore video of how I defend the, the Far East, I would have kept them in Ceylon, and I wouldn't have brought them up unless Singapore was threatened. I would have kept them back as a force in being, and then if someone had moved to Australia or someone had moved to Singapore, Force Z would have appeared. And I would have concentrated naval forces. I would have concentrated naval forces as much as I could. And then hopefully I'd have been able to bring up a force of carriers, cruisers, and everything to Singapore. If Singapore has been secured by lines of Torres Vedras Alafings through Malaya or anything like that, then I would have been able to base Abda and all the other things combined with a significant British carrier and battleship force in Singapore. And then you've got the Japanese have got a problem because it's a large enough force that for them to fight it, they have to send their whole fleet. But if they have to send the whole fleet south, then they've got to rebuild it after the, after the events they've already undertaken, which have taken a lot of energy on them. And it buys time for the Allies to build up stronger defences and also you've now got this large force there. If the Americans then come in and combine with it, you've got a major fleet in the south of the south of Japan, which they've got to fight. You might end up with a battle raging, which actually stops the war in the Philippines and all these things. Might. Not guaranteed. It's a might. It's a what if. Reservoir. Basically, uh, the reservoir issue is the defense of Singapore. There is a water supply, there is a reservoir in Singapore, and it is, has all sorts of defences built around in the 1920s, pillboxes and things, and the commanding officer doesn't defend it. He has reasons for it, but I just don't understand the logic. Constantinople's minor center of the reservoir situation was the Japanese did not intentionally cut it, but its artillery and bombing disrupted the pipes and delivery. True, but they also took the reservoir, so those pipes and deliveries could pipes couldn't be refixed. They actually put troops there. The thing is, the, the, the Japanese troops in Singapore were running out of food, running out of munitions, running out of water themselves. If they don't get the reservoir, they run out of all those things before the, the, the tr British troops sent defending Singapore run out of it. And if the British troops defending their enclave on Singapore Island don't have supplies, have food, have water, have all those things, and the Japanese troops run out of them, the British forces then would probably counterattack and get back to Singapore Island and probably defeat quite a lot of the Japanese. But as it was, it doesn't happen. So it's it. You know. I do explain this all in this whole series of videos.
Bad guy 8829, do you think all fighters attack aircraft should be carrier cable instead of having both Navy and Air Force divine two planes that do pretty much the same thing? Seems like a waste of money. The trouble is the cost requirements to make a ca aircraft carrier capable it would mean it would be prohibitive for the land-based aircraft. And that's the thing. It, the strengthening you need to make into... Uh, a carrier landing is basically a controlled crash which an aircraft will go through several thousand times in its life. Service life. So... That's a lot of design that goes into a ca into an aircraft. You you don't want to do that unless you have to use it because it's going to be a lot of cost as well. Uh, Jeff Hiller, since the USS Nimitz would be have been launched before CVA ones, I imagine the CVA ones would still be around now, working up F thirty five Cs. What would be escorting them? Eighty twos, forty twos, or darings? Darings, but they would be bigger than the 82. They would have been replacements for the 82, so they would be a lot bigger probably than they are now and a lot more general purpose. Death Squad, how useful would the carry in the final countdown be beyond the immediate situation? Ooh, as long as its parts keep working, incredibly useful, but it's going to be keeping those parts working. New IKB 4472, having the 14th Army in China would have caused the Japanese no end of trouble. Yes, mainly because it would have been a kernel which the Chinese forces could have formed themselves up round and used to strengthen their own training and move forward. And the supplies going to those Chinese forces would have allowed them to be far more effective. So it could have caused the Japanese a lot of trouble in China. Right, and it is now... Ooh. Well, if I keep going another 10 minutes. So I'll say this is a 10-minute warning, okay? 10-minute warning, roughly. Okay. Shomak, I agree in the naval general staff that it would have been better to attack the South, but in the South Pacific, because it was clear the US was going to defend lines of supply to Australia. Probably. But the trouble is you get tunnel vision sometimes when you're in strategic command. Uh, groupthink comes in. It's Operation Market Garden. <laughs> Good and bad. And Operation Mark Garden should have involved an amphibious assault as well from the sea, and that would have probably actually made Market Garden work. But they get into the group thing of the air attack and the air assault, and that's going to be the great leap forward and all those things. Jeff Hilo, after at Midway, the Japanese should have forgotten the Aleutians and used the force with Zulu and Nyohisho to attack Midway with the uh, Kido Batai held in reserve to attack the US carriers. That would have been an interesting scenario. So, Thompson, I would have thought keeping the Force Z in Darwin or Brisbane would have been a bit better as spot as they would be better supported by the RAN. The RAN doesn't really exist as the modern force, you understand it, okay, at this point, and their ships are spread around the world. Also, concentrating them on Ceylon means that the ships from the Mediterranean fleet and other forces, which will be sent to form up, and the R-class battleships, which are in the Indian Ocean, can more easily form up on them. And that's a far larger force of ships than what the Australians and New Zealand could provide. Concentrations. Having made incredibly dumb directional decisions in Singapore, I'm not in a position to criticize anyone the like. Mm, okay. Tom Sandow, Dutch squad. And once you the clock, once you found out they're low on supplies, you can concentrate defenses, counterattack along this logic. Then it comes a pitch battle defeat for the IJA, pretty much. Dan Freeman, Dr. Clark, what sort of madness of tactical strategic operation concept is this concentration of force? Madness, I tell you. Send it all out in penny packets. No, concentrate. Uh, Manny, 16 and 40. Did you just say darings with something? So the modern darings, Manny, the Type 45s, the Royal Navy's destroyers now are also called daring class destroyers. I know. It's a name which the Royal Navy likes to refer to, return to for their destroyer classes. It's kind of like battle classes. Um... So they couldn't go with battles, they couldn't go with tribals for next generation destroyers, so they go with darings, and they were very, they're very good ships. I just think there would be more of them, and they'd be slightly bigger if there were CVA one, uh, CVA ones were still in service. As, but, and, but we probably still have the Queen Elizabeth class as it is currently. Those ships would be built, sort of being built, newer versions of them to replace them, because CVA ones would be coming up for replacement now. So they were going to be conventionally powered, so they'd be slightly new.
King's Rook. I've heard that carry aircraft being designed for carrying landings means that the Air Force pilots land them. They oddly take more stress to the airframe than by the soft landings. Mm, not really, but there is some weirdness in how you land them. A lot of back problems with the set control crash landings during 1901. Yep. Jeff Miller, the Japanese first team beats the UK third team, Miller. The best UK troops are in the Middle East or off home. Actually, it's more like the Japanese second team beats the UK's fourth or even fifth team. Um, but yeah, they do well. Bud guy eight eight and two nine. Come on, guys, wouldn't it be cheaper to do one R and D program instead of multiple programs? It'd work with F four program, and you should be able to get more planes and possibly quicker. F thirty five program. I'm sorry, bud guy. F thirty five. Night night in ten minutes. Uh, Come on, guys, wait. Don Rickanway, you're so close to beating him now. You guessed. <laughs> as I was getting this close anyway, I thought I might as well give it a go. JBT nineteen. Hello. I just thought I'd share I was in Chatham today and saw the Iron Destroyer Memorial. Some famous names there. I assume you've been? Yes, it's lovely. I like to take students there. Uh, my favourite place tri field trips to take students are Portsmouth Historic Dockyard and Chatham. I have great fun with both those. Um, I've taken classes around HMS Belfast, but I always lose them. Not in a, not in a bad way. It's kind of like when you take them to Duxford. There's just so much engineering and so much interesting history. You walk on with a class of about 90 to 100 students. You, you eventually, after about six hours, you're waiting, at the, you're waiting at the exit as they come out in dribs and drabs going, ah, and you're like, yeah, form up, form up. We have to get together. We've got a bus coming. Come on, people. Or if you take them to Duxford, you lose all your colleagues who run off to see the SR-71, which is at D Duxford. There is an SR-71 sitting in the American hangar at Duxford, Imperial War Museum. It's lovely, but I lose all my... Co Every time I take engineering students there, I lose all my colleagues around about Hangar 2 to run off towards the, uh, hangar, five, uh, hangar 5, where the uh, SR-71 is, and I end up taking the entire 120 students or two, uh, once 200 students around solo for the next... until we reach there, at which point I have to break the news to my engineering lecturing colleagues that they will be coming with me and they will be taking over for going to the next... Well, so I can have a break, because I've been speaking now for four hours constantly. At not at this level, at the... Brace yourselves. At the full lecturing level, which is this uh, for four hours non-stop. Which I can keep up constantly for those four hours, but is a little bit loud. And after four hours, my voice does feel like... Eh. But normally, of course, I talk at this level. Dev Squad. Uh, beyond what Dutch Clark says, the extra weight on the aircraft will decrease speed and maneuverability. Ability by ability, land-based aircraft will outmaneuver a carrier-based plane. You... Uh, depends. Also, the sustained B-29 operation in China, rather than half-hearted political statement. Yep. Yikers, thanks, Dr. Luck. You're always first, uh, uh, first now on to the four-hour dry dock long. Well, in ten minutes. <laughs> Gahman, uh, I feel the RN should increase, uh, uh, should purchase some Corvettes, fast attack vessels, tamer size, for use at the Suez and the Gulf as well as Gibraltar. Eh, could be interesting. Thomas van der Velde. And not to mention, clear out the Shelt estuary first so they didn't have this single road issue. At least they could have dug in along that road and resupply by sea. Yes. Would uh, Sam Thompson, would like to hear your thoughts on the failure seas and Antwerp probably in 1944. Seems like it would have been accelerated and offensive with better logistics, if they'd had better logistics. Come on, guys, read Penny Packets. If you have units that can bite into the enemy and the GTO, so small units, swarm works. Not with ships after air power is a thing. Yes. Basically, if you had town class cruisers out there, you could have gone surface raiding. Without town class cruisers, no. Jeff Beeler, what and when is the next topic? I'll be uploading them, but it's Arafusa class cruisers on Tuesday. John Luke, thanks for asking the questions tonight. Always your show's grand. Thank you. <laughs> J. 
JDP19. Unfortunately, Cavalier was shut down internally due to COVID, as you might know. That is rather wrong. Thank you for an awesome meeting. Pleasure, Dan Trim. Manly1640. So, with Singapore, they just left their water supply open to be captured by enemy, and then, completely without any way to predict it, the enemy captured the water supply. Pretty much. Yes. Count the drum, but it's a blackbird. I know, but they are the lecturing staff, okay? There are supposed to be, with 200 students, there is supposed to be one of us for every 30 students. So there are you, we usually take seven. It ends up being me. I don't mind it. I would just mind it if I was getting the seven times the paycheck. But okay, so I wish that USN got a version of F-22 that could use a better fleet defense fighter than the Super Hornet. I'm not sure if the F-35C is going to be good enough. It's going to be enough for a bit. Jeremy, serious question. Was there an occasion that ship or museum loudspeakers needed to re regather a crowd? Possibly. Me and HMS Belfast have a long-standing appreciation of what chocolate that buys you. Um, Nick Nader Singles, if you go to States, I'll give you a tour of US Air Force Museum in Dayton. I grew up there. Cool. If I come, I'll say, well, when I get to the States, yes. <laughs> Shamak, it was never going to work long time. They were flying everything in, but if you have, if you can have a Burmese railroad, it suddenly becomes practical to turn the air war in China. Yes, it does, and then you don't need so much the island hopping campaign because you have your bombers already in range. Sam Thompson, someday we'll read about a stolen and melted down S <laughs> seventy one to get the titanium scrap value. I've run across at least three in USA USA museums. Some are pretty close to roadways. Mm. The Commonwealth forces retreated towards the city, crowded with both troops and civilians. The whole scenario was pretty much a disaster. Yes, and they had no plans for the retreat. They hadn't organized it or thought it out in advance. Monday, 1640. Is the Build Cos uh, Pumps podcast available on Spotify, or where do I find it? I think it is able to be found on Spotify, but I know it's been able to find on Simplecast. Do you know what I know? And when things get back to normal, and if you plan to meet up with subscribers, HMCS Hider. Yes, I do. And when things get back to normal, I do indeed. Right. Thank you, everyone. Take care. I'm going to say goodbye now and good night. But thank you. Take care. Uh, Breckin Kennel. Caroline is staying for at least six months in Belfast. I'm hoping, fingers crossed, she gets to stay there properly and they probably support it. Come on, guys, rear 35 fleet defense. Maybe another type will be needed in their 35 life sign, but I would make China and Russia to play their cards before finalizing design. That's the whole point. That's all. Thank you. Take care. Greg Sarsky, thank you. John Shea, thank you. And Sally and Thompson, thank you. Talio, Jeff Beeler, email. <laughs> Ryan. Thank you, GG4V40. Thank you, everyone. I hope you had a nice evening. I hope you've enjoyed this. And thank you again for all the support. That's fine. Dirt Squad. Yeah, that's good. Dirt Squad, I'm wondering how much F-35 will suffer from being visible on long wave radar. Hmm, there could be some fun on that one. Take care, Kings Rook. And take care, Carl Harmon. Wait for the Steve, uh, Steve George on build pumps when it's on that one issue. Take care, everyone. Thank you. And thank you again to all my subscribers. Thank you to everyone who's on Discord. Thank you to everyone who likes these things. And thank you to everyone who pressed the little bell down there. Thank you. And see you on Tuesday for the Arafusa class. The destroyer personality in a cruiser body. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Take care.